Okay. When should I start? We're a little early. Do you want to start? No. Yeah. There's also. Oh, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Is it too dark? Probably. It was perfect the other way. It's like dark is music. The one, they don't like one set of lights. I just want to make sure that the thing is working. Thank you. Welcome to our 2023 WCSB project. We are a little bit early, and it's only a couple of minutes, and we're waiting on a couple of judges. But um, to let you know, the seniors that you see standing here and around the edges of the room are members of both Toledo County High School <coughs> and Toledo Junior Governor School. So over the last four years, they have been going to school in the Duke building for their Day is kind of the culmination of everything that they've been doing since their freshman year. As the senior capstone project expires this week in June, they design their own learning facility. They are charged with finding a description for them for the professional side of a business or of an organization of some sort. They also research a paper kind of extensively, it's kind of a big one. And then they also design a community service project that ties in everything. So what you guys are going to hear over the next hour or so is a tiny snippet of what they do for the community. So please feel free to ask excellent questions. Um, there's going to be a question period at the end. Yes. Should I wait? Yeah. Should I wait? For um, no, we can go ahead and go and she can just keep this when she, I don't know what's going on. She can't do it. Okay. Okay. So I would like to introduce Ms. Brooke Hall. She's going to uh, discuss with you her experiences at Rapid Car. Brooke? Hi. As she said, my name is Brooke Hall and I'm going to be talking about my analysis of African American history today. So um, the reason I got into this project was because I've always had a passion for history. It's always been something that I've been passionate about since I was younger. And recently I got into the activism for African Americans and the analysis of their history and the um, emphasis on their history. And for this project, I decided that I wanted to focus on Louisa County in general, which is something that we didn't really learn about in school, which is kind of something that I feel like is um, a failure of Louisa County's elementary school system. I feel like that's something that we really should be talking about is the um, history of slavery in our county and something that we can see directly on the farms that we pass when we're driving down the road. And it has a deep um, history 
just within every citizen, everyone in this county. So I want to introduce my mentors, um, Mrs. Caitlin Coughlin. She's the executive director at the Louisa County Historical Society. And then Mr. Michael Lachance, um, who is the president of the Elizabeth Aiken Nolting Charitable Foundation, and they oversee Brackett's Farm. So I worked mainly with um, Mrs. Coughlin out of the Historical Society, where we did research. And I also worked with Mr. Lachance at Brackett's Farm, where we worked in the slave quarters um, to kind of explore some of the more recent history of Brackett's. So for my research paper, I wrote about African-American history and ongoing hardships, where I focused on um, dehumanization, underrepresentation, um, discrimination, and villainization of African-Americans within our history. And when I spoke about the dehumanization, I spoke about slavery and I spoke about segregation. When I spoke about the underrepresentation, I talked about media and politics. As for discrimination, I spoke about um, housing discrimination and school segregation. And in my villainization portion, I spoke about police brutality as well as mass incarceration of black individuals, specifically black males. Um, so I think that this, this topic helped me overall with my um, overall capstone project because it gave me a better um, view of the overall um, overarching history of African Americans, which obviously helps with my analysis of a more specific group of these enslaved people. Um, so for my internship, what I did is I would sit down with Mrs. Coughlin and we would go over um, specific ways to research and we used specific technologies to do that. Um, the way that went is basically she would teach me how to do something and then she would leave me for my community service where I would do specific research. But we worked with Ancestry.com where I got to look at um, multiple primary documents and she taught me how, just kind of the reins of it and how to explore the different documents and how to find what I was looking for. And also I learned about transcription. Um, so at this time, if you guys want to look in your folders that are in front of you, um, I, the first page in there is a, actually an excerpt from Sally Watson's will where you will see um, a list of names and so for this project, transcription was a big part of it. I had to get that out of the way in the beginning, and I had to learn, I, I obviously I wasn't perfect, but I had to learn how to at least be able to read most of the words on a page. So I wanted to ask you guys if you can give me one name from that list, um, just right off, like looking at the sheet. Mm -hmm. The first one is Yeah, so the first one's Bina and she was actually one of the um, focuses of my overall project um, when it got to the exhibit, exhibit portion. But I think that that's just something really important to see um, is the direct um, clippings from the primary documents because it really shows a big part of my project. And this would be Sally Watson's will that you see up here where there are other um, focuses of my research um, specific people. So I spoke about an exhibit that I, I did, which you'll see up here. Um, and the second um, handout in your folder is a list of all the enslaved people's names that we were able to find within the, um, the Watson Family Bible, David Watson's will, Sally Watson's will, as well as the Freedmen's Bureau. And what we did with those records is we were able to kind of culminate everything that we had found um, and I learned how to make an exhibit from Mrs. Coughlin, and that was something really huge that I took from it, was learning how to create and present an exhibit. So and that brings me to my community service. So at um, the Louisa County Historical Society, as I mentioned, we use Ancestry.com. I also used ArcGIS to create um, a map of the enslaved people that I found. And um, you'll see here on the right is some of my work from Brackets. So we basically looked at some documents that were around from the 1960s to the early 2000s at Brackets, and Mr. Lachance taught me how to categorize that information and find out what was important and what wasn't important, and that's just a really big part of history as a whole, is learning how to categorize that information and what's important and what's not important. So 
This is one of the maps that I created. You'll see on the outskirts is um, information from the Watson Family Bible. Um, and then in brackets is in the background there. And then the blue is David Watson's will, while the green is Sally Watson's will, and the purple is the Freedmen's Bureau record. So it kind of was used as just a way to place a specific enslaved people at brackets, um, which has a, a very deep meaning, at least to me. I think it's really important to at least know the names of these people. And there's not a lot of um, records available. And for the scope of this project, it was pretty limited on what I could do. So what I was able to do was to at least explore the names of these people. So I created ex an exhibit, and I also created a presentation that I gave to um, Mr. Travato's 11th grade DE US history class. And I, they were learning about slavery around the same time that I did my presentation. And it was really helpful for them to just see an insight of the slavery that was in Louisa County in specific. So I want to talk about the personal impact of this project. It was really important to me to be able to explore new ways of communicating with people. I think it's a really important thing to know how to talk to different generations and different levels of people that you respect. And I also learned how to research, which is a very valuable experience. There's nothing more important to me in my life than being able to research and being able to find the answers to questions that maybe haven't been answered before or haven't been answered in depth. And I also think that it's just important that I now know how to work in a professional setting and I know how to create an exhibit and I know how to create a presentation and plan for a presentation. And I think those things are all just really important in terms of my academic development and growth. So that brings me to the fact that I want to go to William & Mary um, in my future, where I plan to pursue many internships. And I want to um, make sure that I continue to grow on this path of learning how to research and learning how to get involved in local, my local community in terms of the historical impact that has been made there. So that brings me to the end. Thank you. And if anyone has any questions, I'll take them now. Yes? So the exhibit that you'll see here um, is actually going to be displayed at the Louisa County Historical Society in their museum. And um, Brackett's Farm also wants a copy so that they can um, have it within the, the parlor of the slave quarters so that they can do walkthrough tours um, so that people can um, see the, a deeper history, deeper than what they can already see when they walk through the slave quarters. Yeah, I think that um, something that I would love to see would just be to be um, topics such as this, where we can see specific farms that are still running and operating as Brackets is today and see the, the impact that it had on the history of Louisa and the connections that um, the, the farm had with the different farms and that spanned all throughout the county. Um, it's important to see at least the names and maybe some stories of enslaved people um, on those, those plantations at that time. Yes? No, no, I, it, it certainly could be possible within some documents, but within these documents, they are simply listed on a first name basis. Um, they're listed on the same pages as um, like household items. So they, it really shows the depth of the dehumanization that occurs. They, they, don't, even, they don't even get last names. They don't get the basic um, respects or anything of that sort. They are purely traded and inherited and so yeah there are some documents where we were able to find like say um, Hannah she was one that was on the sheet that was in your folder she is either the daughter or the mother of another woman named Hannah and she's listed with a child on other documents but 
it's really hard because they don't even really accurately um, take down the, the ages of these people. So it's kind of, it's really hard to kind of establish that family line in general. Yes? Um, I think that people are very, um, they don't, they, people don't realize these days the implications of the past. And in order to be kind of understanding about what's going on today and the um, hardships that African Americans are still facing to this day is to understand their past. And I think that's something that was really big to me was, it, from my own experience, I didn't know these things. I didn't know that um, the enslaved people in the wills were willed pages away from things like candlesticks. And it's, I think it would be really important for people to understand the depth of the dehumanization that took place during um, slavery. Yes? Um, I don't have that like as a county, but I think the names that you can see on the list kind of speak to the volume of the enslaved population on these um, these plantations. Um, I don't have like an, an altogether number because that kind of the scope is more limited than that in this project. But I think that just seeing the the amount of people that were working and living on these farms um, kind of nods to that and can. Um, give a little bit of insight because it, it was a it, pretty um, well-sized farm, so it was quite a bit of people. What, what would they have in them? What was the tobacco, or was that the main cash crop? So initially it was tobacco, and then they switched to wheat. Yeah, that was March 11th, um, oh. Saturday, yeah. Yeah, so um, we were able to just answer some questions from some of the Historical Society members on Saturday, and it was kind of the first um, like exposure to my exhibit, which will be going back to the Historical Society. Any other questions? Thank you. We'll stand over there, even though it's okay. 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 That's on if it's on. I'll probably leave it off until. I set this here. Oh no, she wants me to put it on there.
you all don't mind, I'm going to put some things on your table. Mm -hmm. I'm going to place some items on your table. How pellets. Okay, I hope that these will fit. Is that everything? Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Feel free to touch them.
said that wasn't going to be a very good topic, and at the end of it, he got to the first of five and said, but the, but the young lady who was the first job, um, I had a young lady who was, her original topic was taxes, and like, what do you pay? And I'm like, please don't make me be a speaker about taxes. And uh, I said, why did you pick this? Well, my dad said it would be great. And I'm like, well, what do you like? He loved it. And ended up working with our English department and had a Look deep into nature, and then you will understand everything better. Albert Einstein. Good morning. My name is Allison Allen, and as an avid nature lover and someone who enjoys working with children, my capstone project is environmental education and youth. And judges, you can see that I've placed items on your table. Feel free to touch these and investigate them uh, while I'm speaking today. I had a summer internship for this project. It was served at the Louisa Virginia Cooperative Extension Office, uh, which is located right off of Main Street. You've probably seen it in, when you're going through Louisa. Um, and here at VCE, this is ran through Virginia Tech. I'm sure you've heard of Virginia Cooperative Extension. They run all of the agricultural and environmental activities in the county um, through 4-H. I'm sure you've seen those signs or maybe even went to 4-H camp when you were a kid. Um, that's where this is coming from. My mentor for actually both my internship and my community service was Miss Jenny Thompson. Uh, she's the lady pictured in pink. She is the senior 4-H extension agent and the unit coordinator for the Louisa office for Virginia Cooperative Extension. And for my internship, I worked directly underneath her, but I also worked with the other VCE employees as well to basically help them run extension activities and um, carry out 4-H events, 4-H camps, and kind of get a hands-on experience of what they're doing with the youth around our county. And with this internship, my goal was just to learn professional communication skills, learn uh, youth development, as Jenny works with students on a daily basis. Um, and I wanted to just get that hands-on experience uh, working in the county with the community. So one of the things for my internship that I did was in preparation for the Louisa County Ag Fair, which was held, um, it was in the middle of July this past year, I made flyers to advertise for the Louisa County 4-H Club. So you can see here were a few that I did. I had the Clover Buds, the Livestock Club, and the Horse and Pony Club. I made these flyers. They went out on social media to advertise the clubs. They also were posted at the Ag Fair, and people took them to kind of get, we wanted students to get more interested around the community um, and basically get more participation in 4-H. 4-H is such a, such a great um, opportunity for kids to be involved in. So as part of my internship, uh, Jenny used me to basically advertise that around the county. With my internship, um, you can see on the left is a picture of the schedule of events of the Ag Fair. Uh, you can see under Thursday is the Hippology Contest. As part of my internship, I actually planned and ran that contest. If you don't know, Hippology is the study of horses. So this contest was a written exam about all horse terminology, medical, um, medical like uh, equipment. Um, it dealt with feed identification, tack identification, equipment, basically anything dealing with the horse. This, this contest um, dealt with that. And it was open to all 4-H and FFA members in the county. Um, so that was a great thing for me to do with my internship. I learned a lot. I got to see youth actually come out and participate in something that I had done, which was super cool and super pleasing. 
On the right here, you can see this is the written exam that actually the students took when they took this contest. And there was a junior level and a senior level. Moving on to my community service, after working with Jenny, I knew that I wanted to, con to continue to work with the youth in our county. So I thought no better than to actually run my own camp. So with Jenny's help, I ran a 4-H Natural Resource Day. Um, it was held on our October asynchronous day from 9 in the morning until 5 p.m. So it was a very long day, but um, we opened it up to grades 3 through 5 around the county, and we actually had 17 youth from around the county come to this camp, which was super, it was a super successful turnout, and I was super happy with that. And I wanted to give students around the community an opportunity to get involved with the environment and wildlife and learn more uh, through a day camp with 4-H. As you can see here, these are some of the activities the kids did throughout the day. I had field professionals come in um, and lead activities and lessons for them throughout the day. I wanted it to be as engaging as possible. So I actually had Miss Jenny herself lead a lesson on wildlife. She has a master's in wildlife biology, so I thought no one better than herself to lead that. The students got to look at pelts, which judges you have on your table, skulls, tracks, and more, and learn more about the native wildlife right here in our county and in Virginia. After that, Ms. Richardson, who many of you probably know here at the high school, she's a master, master naturalist, so she actually came and did a lesson on birds. Uh, the students got to learn about songbirds. They did a bird feeder activity where they made their own bird feeder to take home. And then we actually did a lesson on predatory owls. So the students got to learn about what owls eat, kind of their behavioral patterns, and then the youth got to dissect owl pellets, which judges you also have on your table. Those are those petri dishes um, with bones and furs and things. Um, so the students got to dissect those, and they were super excited about that. Um, that was really cool to watch them get excited about something they were learning about, so that was super pleasing on my end. After that, to top the day off, um, I had a fisheries biologist and two forest technicians come out. The fisheries biologist was Mr. Jason Emmel. He works with Solitude Lake Management, um, and he did fish prints with the students. So they learned about fish anatomy, they learned about the different fish here around the county, um, and like in our local lakes, the fish we actually used came from Lake Anna, and um, he did prints with the students with those. After that, we had two forest technicians come out from the Virginia Department of Forestry who led a lesson on tree cookies. Um, the students got to look at how to actually age a tree. And then the books that you have on your table, they used those to identify trees um, that were outside of the office. After that, you can see here is a relay race. The students got to learn about wildfire prevention and kind of do a mock if they were putting out a fire using cups of water and do a relay race with that. So they really enjoyed it. It was great to see the kids actually involved and excited about what they were learning. To assess the impact of my community service, I had the students um, do a paper survey in the morning and the evening of my community service. So these are electronic results, but they essentially were given paper and a pencil at the beginning of the morning at the end of the day, and I asked them a few basic questions like, how interested are you in the environment, or would you want to pursue a career? And these were some of the results. So at the end of the day, roughly 80% said that they would want to spend more time in the outdoors, and that was a huge success. So after the community service, I saw that kids were more interested, and that was super pleasing to see. Not only that, another portion of my community service was actually with Ms. Shannon King, who is not only the advisor, but she also is an ecology teacher. Um, and last semester, I helped her write a grant for uh, buying some equipment in order to do stream monitoring here at the high school. So we ultimately want to establish a water quality baseline here at the high school. Um, using citizen science, so her ecology students this semester are actually going to be using SOS protocols to do biological monitoring here to establish the water quality here on campus. Um, I currently am leading a team of six students from her second period and training them with Save Our Streams protocols so that they can learn how to do that and then we can implement it here and then later go out to Brackett's Farm, um, which is in Zion's Crossroads, to establish a baseline of the water quality there as well. For my research, after doing all this, I knew that I really wanted to focus on environmental education and why it's so important for youth to be involved. Um, so my research showed me three things. One, that, being, that having youth involved in environmental education impacts them both mentally and physically, and it benefits them in both ways. Two, it contributes positively to their youth development. It creates their, um, it really develops their cognitive thinking, their critical thinking. It helps them build those teamworking skills, and it helps them be a better individual. And three, 
Having them involved in environmental education helps expand their environmental knowledge. And with that, they're more willing to conserve the environment, they're more willing to be an active environmental steward, and they're more willing to care about our world. This project overall was um, a great experience for me. I learned a lot, and it was really something uh, valuable to have because I'm so passionate about wildlife and about the outdoors. Um, but I don't think that's exactly where I want to go after this. So with that said, I will be attending Virginia Tech in the fall, and I hope to study animal science and later per, uh, pursue a career in agriculture. I want to say a special thank you to Ms. King, who was not only uh, my governor's school advisor, but one of my mentors as well. And then with everyone who made my camp possible, Ms. Jenny, all the field professionals who came out. And thank you to all of you for being a captive audience. And I now open the floor to your questions. Yes. I did not go to the actual 4-H camp, but I did, um, are you talking about with my internship? Yes. I assisted in a clover bud camp, actually, which dealt with, like, it was like an astronaut space type thing. So I helped with that. Um, and then I did a lot of clover bud activities, actually, with um, my internship. And many of you know, like, Parks and Rec has camps. Uh, over the summer for those students, I went there and we did 4-H uh, activities with those students as well. Yes. I think when youth are involved in environmental activities, not only does it, it develop them like I'm talking about, but it gives them a sense of community. It gets them involved with other students their age and they can see that they're helping something more than themselves. They're benefiting the environment, they're benefiting our world, and I think that's a really powerful thing for them to be involved and actively be doing something outside, and it's so good to be outside. Um, it gets them more confidence, it gives them peace of mind, um, and so I think that's a really powerful thing for them to be engaged in environmental activities. Yes? Yeah, um, it looks like you did a tremendous amount of your service um, before um, the school year even started. How hard was it to get yourself motivated to, to go out and and you know, before the Ike Bear area and all that, it looked like you did extensive. And, and I'm assuming you were there for all three days of the, the Ike Bear. Yes, yes. I spent a lot of time in the office with Jenny over the summer. I had to go there a lot during July, um, and even all the, all the way through the months of September for my internship to get everything put together. My community service that running that day camp was a lot of work. I had to extensively communicate with all the professionals um, and get them get the activities planned, get the lessons planned. So. I really had to kind of think of my goals and what I wanted out of it and kind of use that to push myself to uh, actually get it, to get it done. How long, um, how hard was it to, to keep, uh, maybe being married to an elementary school teacher, <laughs> I, I hear a lot of these stories, um, how hard was it to, to come up with lessons for third, fourth, and fifth grade? I had to use a lot of my resources. So I consulted Jenny a lot as she works with youth. I had to kind of say like, what, what will kids actually be interested in? How long is their attention span? How long are they going to pay attention to me and actually be interested in what we're talking about? I used um, curriculum books that are actually on the web, and I was like, looked, wanted to look at some activities that other people have done. Um, and I basically just had to, using my experience working with the clubs, had to think about what are the kids going to be interested in? What are they going to be excited in? And I had to plan the day out so that they weren't sitting for too long. They were actively involved in something, um, and they, it was changing schedule the whole day so that they were excited and moving from one thing to the other. One last thing. I'm not familiar <clears throat> with fish prints. That's the first fish prints. Yeah. So you take, it's, it's a Japanese form of art. You take uh, a live fish, some people do it with like rubber fish, and you put, you like paint this ink on it, and then you just put a piece of paper on it, and it comes out like just like the fish. Oh, wow. It's really pretty. It's very cool. Yeah. It was very messy. <laughs> Yes. Um, what do you think is the environmental challenge we're facing here? I mean, is, there, is there a particular environmental problem or challenge or question that we should be focused on? Um, I think water conservation is a big one in Louisa, especially with everything that our lake is going through with like the algae blooms and um, eutrophication. I think that's one of the main things that I'm hearing about in Louisa County. That, and that's part of the reason, like, that's what we're doing with the Save Our Streams um, initiative with Miss King's classes, is we're trying to establish that water quality baseline and learn about our water here to later protect those water resources, the fish, the um, organisms that are living in there. Yes? What have you found so far with the 
We actually haven't, um, we haven't sampled yet, but we are planning to do that in a few weeks. Yes. Um, I have to imagine that though it was hard to convince yourself to do it, it might have actually made this a little bit easier because you actually had more time yes. versus doing it while school has started. Yes. How do you convince the people who are going to be doing this in the future that that might be the better way to go? Yes, I would certainly say do a summer internship. It saved me so much time, and I was way less stressed when school came around, and we were doing all the in-class um, assignments for Miss King. I was able to already have done my internship and done a large portion of my community service. All I was doing was planning my day camp. Um, so it was really nice to have that out of the way and kind of have that peace of mind that I was done and I could use what I had learned for my research and for my in-class assignments. So if you're thinking about it and you have the time and you have the opportunity, I would do a summer internship um, so that you can kind of put all your effort into that over the summer. And because when you're in school, you're kind of divided with your time, with your effort. Um, so I would say do it over the summer and get the most out of your experience while you have it. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I need to get all my animals, I guess. I have to know, did the fish survive after you did the painting on them? Oh, they were dead. They were fish that they had caught and studied, I believe. Okay. All right. I'm not going to do it. It's a good cause. What is That's a white-tailed deer.
God. <laughs> So I'm going to clip this on you. And this is just, I just don't want to clip your hand. Oh, yeah. um, it's for the computer so that okay. they can hear you online. Okay. okay. Is that good? Yeah. Go, go, go. Okay. And then this one is, so I think, like, you can hear you. Okay. And so, it's like, this case, I like, hold it up here. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, and they miss the word, it's okay. Okay. It's, like, it's not on right now. Okay. Do you want me to turn it on? Um, or are you going to wait? I'll wait. Okay. <laughs> All right. And so then, is this yours? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. This <laughs> Um, she, it's a, so this, take a test this one? Run. Yeah, take a test run. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So not, and, but if it doesn't work, remember, it, this is its little, this is its thing, so folk point it to here if, mm -hmm. it, if you have trouble. Okay. 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 All right. You want me to? <laughs> okay. So it's on. So I just stuck a candy just. in my mouth. <laughs> yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Hello everyone, my name is Hannah Farmer and I'm a student at Louisa County High School. For my senior project, I did animal enrichment and why it is important. I chose this topic because ever since I was a kid, I've been extremely passionate about animals and their health, both mentally and physically, and that's in any type of environment they may be in, if it's in captivity or out in the wild. This quote really stuck out to me by Theodore Roosevelt. He said, the wild and its habitat cannot speak, so we must and we will. I believe that it's our responsibility that we speak up for these animals as they cannot tell us what they need from us and we need to be able to recognize the issues that they are facing and fix it for them because they cannot do it themselves. Um, my two mentors for this project was McKenna Roberts and Gavin McGrath. McKenna Roberts is a school teacher here. She teaches the small animal care classes. She works with her students every day in educating them about the importance of ensuring that they have the proper care and are taking care of as they should. And then Gavin McGrath is the lead zookeeper at Maymont Park. He works with his team every day in making sure that all of his animals are getting the proper care and the proper habitat and the proper um, diet that fits them most suitable. And then for my project, I focused on what is animal or what is animal enrichment and why is it important. Animal enrichment is these activities given to them to be able to stimulate their minds and let them use their natural behaviors. It is important that they do that because if they are not able to do that, they often have stress-related behaviors and they tend to be lonely or they will um, kind of leads to a smaller lifespan and it's it's important that they use those natural behaviors such as like tearing things apart, how they hunt, things like that in order to reduce those stress-related behaviors like pacing around their habitat or picking at their fur or a lack of appetite. Some popular enrichment that may be in your homes are Kong dog toys where you shove the food inside of the dog toy to be able to entertain them for a few hours so they don't go to shore your house a few <laughs> hours later. And it's important for all animals, not just dogs, to be able to do that. They all need to be able to use those behaviors in order to stimulate their minds and keep them healthy mentally and physically. So for my internship, I worked at Maymont Park. Maymont Park is kind of like a preserve for nature. They focus on connecting humans with nature as that's kind of one of the leading issues now to a lot of our environmental problems is people are not as connected with nature as they should be and kind of lose that care for it. 
and I mainly worked at Raptor Valley. I wanted to help them with the enrichment portion of their um, wildlife center because they don't normally prioritize it as they have a lot more to prioritize as like their actual physical health and their diet and things like that. So they don't have much effort or resources to be able to put into it. So I first started with a lot of research. I created proposals as well as answered these series of questions. The series of questions as well as the proposal are in those pages in the folders given to you all. And the questions were about each type of breed that they have and that specific bird of that breed. Um, you each have an individual breed on the paper, so it's all different. But um, some of the questions included like certain diet restrictions that they have and then certain disabilities. So the enrichment and the proposals are suitable for that specific bird depending on those restrictions. And the proposals where there's checks and X's, the X's are obviously what isn't approved and then the checks were what were approved. Most of the X's were from kind of those diet restrictions or disabilities as well as what Maymont just doesn't use in general. They don't use live feed, they don't have blood in any of their food, and they also don't use rope because it can be harmful for the animals. So some of the enrichment was not approved for that. I did get it approved by the lead Aquarius as well as the lead zookeeper. They went over it and told me what was suitable and what was not. So some of the birds that I worked with were barred owls, barn owls, broadwing hawks, red-tailed hawks, um, bald eagles, as well as vultures. These birds were both really intriguing, but also terrifying to work with as it was a brand new experience. Not many people are up that close with these birds, so it was pretty cool to witness that. Um, with the approved enrichment, I then went on to my community service. For my community service, I worked with these small animal care classes here at Louisa County High School. I gave them a lesson about enrichment and why it's important and how we can implement it easily at our homes with the animals that we do have. Um, we used all recycled materials, one, because it's safer for the animals, depending on what type of animal it is, because obviously like dogs can't have certain <laughs> things like that, but the birds it is best suitable for. And I also used recycled materials, so it can just show that it's a very easy thing to implement. It can be anything around your house, so you can just pick up and make something for these animals to be able to enjoy. Um, it was a very tedious process at first because um, we had to make sure all of the tape and all the stickers were off of all the materials because it's not safe for the animals to consume. And we had to just make sure that all the materials used were completely um, safe for those animals. Um, this is what some of the enrichment ended up looking like. I took it back to Maymont after the students completed it, which I was very impressed with their work. And you might be wondering what this is, but um, they usually pull the pieces out or shred the boxes or paper, whatever it is. They pull it apart to be able to get to the food that we placed inside of it. We did place some feathers in it and things like that to be able to encourage the birds a little bit more to mess with it. Um, I did set some examples on the tables in front of you all, and I will get you to open them to find your human treats later on. <laughs> and the birds were definitely a little bit confused at first, like why is this in my enclosure? But once they kind of scoped it out a little bit, they got a lot more used to it, and they ended up playing with it a lot more. In this one here, they have the mouse in his mouth, and then the eagle over there is shredding it apart. They were definitely the most too interested in the enrichment. They immediately both pounced on it and started tearing it apart, which I was kind of shocked to see. But it was really intriguing being able to observe these animals and what they do when you try to give them this type of opportunity. Um, my personal impact for it was, I would say, I finally got to do what I've been wanting to do as a kid. I have always been passionate about the education portion of wildlife as well as just being able to experience it hands on and work with them up close. Um, one of the most like scariest parts of my project, I would say, was those proposals because when I first was emailing my mentor, he told me I had to walk in with these proposals already done, and I was like, I don't really know much about this, so I'm a little bit worried. So I, all that research took a very long time to be able to do this, but it ended up being okay, and I was also kind of scared of presenting it to the higher up people at Maymont just because like it's a little intimidating at first, but they were super nice, they were super knowledgeable, and helped me throughout the whole process, and it ended up most of my enrichments did get approved. Like I said, it was just the ones that were not suitable for those specific things because of the diet restrictions and things like that. Um, if I were to do something differently, I would say 
I would probably do more hours, just more than what I had done. I did get the limit, but I probably would have given more effort into it as I'm not sure if Maymont is really continuing it anymore, but I do wish that they do continue it, and I would love to be a help in that. So I honestly might end up volunteering later on because he said that there's plenty of opportunities. And then my future plans, I want to continue out this passion of mine, but I do want to focus a little bit more on the marine biology side of it. I want to be able to work hands-on as well as educating people about the importance of protecting our oceans. And I want to say thank you for all of my classmates for being there with me, as well as Ms. King for helping us throughout the whole process, and obviously for my mentors as well for creating this opportunity for me. Now, before I answer any questions, I would like the judges to open up their enrichment and kind of tell me your experience on it. And would it be better for me to just hand you the little candies given to you or the human treats, or do you prefer getting entertainment out of it? <laughs> While they're opening it, anyone can also ask me questions as well. Mm -hmm. um, when it was my freshman year, I was definitely a little intimidated by all the presentations and things like that. And obviously, because of COVID, we missed a lot of our opportunities to do the presentations and things like that. So I would definitely practice when you can or do certain things, speaking public if you can, um, to be able to kind of get comfortable with it. But um, and I would also kind of do what you're passionate about. I was super passionate about this project and you're able to tell when you're passionate about it and you have fun doing it where it's not like a chore to finish this project, you just enjoy doing it. And it looks like, yes. Um, did you find, I mean, I, when you go to zoos a lot, you mm -hmm. see enrichment for elephants and, and the large cats and the, and the bigger animals. And you very rarely see enrichment, especially for raptors. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like, the area was kind of new to them as well as it was being new to you? I believe it was most likely new to them. I remember one of my first days at Maymont, he said that raptors are the most lacked with the enrichment just because they are like still trying to discover how to make things a little bit more fun for them. Kind of the most like popular ones are like perches and things like that, but that doesn't really give them the opportunity to hunt like they would in the wild. So providing enrichment like that was definitely a new thing to them. And I think that's also why they're kind of so confused and it was first in their enclosure. So I would definitely say that it was a lot newer to those animals, yes. Yes. Um, I know um, Maymont I guess most of the, I'm just looking at um, where it says, most, were most of these um, were raptors, I guess, mm -hmm. brought there because they had been injured? Yes, most, all of the animals um, inhabited there, they all have some type of disability that they cannot look, they can no longer be in the wild, so they have them there and they were previously injured. And, and also, did the other birds eventually go around and, and, and go after them? Yes, I definitely, I sat there for many hours watching them, <laughs> and they, like I said, those two birds immediately went on to it, but the other ones did end up engaging a little bit, probably not as much as I had hoped, but they definitely still, like, messed around with it too, a little bit. <laughs> now, is there um, any situations with the birds there at Neymont, um, you know, with it being right there on the James River, mm -hmm. outside wildlife coming in? Yeah, there's definitely, they have the animals and or the raptors in those enclosures, it's, it's open on the top, but none of them are able to fly large or far amounts. So I've seen multiple like little birds come in and hang out with them. So <laughs> yeah, they definitely come and kind of hang out with all the animals there. Any other questions? Yes, me and um, Gavin McGrath went and we set them in there and we did kind of back out because they were definitely intimidated by us being in there. They, like in some of those, it does so, show the um, stress-related behaviors that they do often have and a lot of them are crowds. So they aren't super used to humans, so we did step out, but I did go in there to be able to put the enrichment in there. 
Oh yeah, they were sitting like a few feet away from me and there was like a big owl just staring at me. The one owl, like every time I walked by its enclosure, it would just stare at me. So it was kind of, it was pretty cool, but definitely intimidating at first. <laughs> Um, so we stuck like all the tails of the mice out of the like project a little bit so you can kind of see what's in there so they would be a little bit more engaged. So definitely wherever like the mice was like sticking out a little bit, they went straight for that. <laughs> Thank you. Test, test. for sure. this I mean so this is for I'm just gonna move your hair I don't want to click mm -hmm. it and um this is sorry this is for the computer so like online okay I just don't want you to be clipped to it okay is it videoing me right now so can it hear me right yes. now yes. okay yeah. okay okay and then again this is just make sure you want to I know, but we don't, oh, okay. we don't need to turn on the yet. So we'll, we'll turn on my port, but make sure you pull it up here, okay? And it does need you to write about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. For you, mm -hmm. take it for a test run. So that way is the way you want to go. And if it doesn't work, then point it towards here. Maybe it's, maybe it's sleeping. Oh, it's one slide. <laughs> oh, it's one slide, <laughs> oh. That's why I didn't go anywhere. Okay, so then go back. There you go. Okay. The blue tape is for you to run your thumb on so that you don't make your slides go clicky all over the place. <laughs> all right. So we'll turn the phone. we get a little bit closer. Just okay. share your story. You've done all the hard work. Mm -hmm. Now you're just telling everybody about what you did, which is really cool. And if, if you forget something, just keep going to, on something else because I don't know what you were supposed to say. Mm -hmm. She, she might know, but she's not going to tell anybody. <laughs> right? Yes. So, just share. Share whatever it is, okay? Okay. I do have a request. Would I be able to get somebody to go with me at a level to pick up Harry Pizza book? Yeah, who you want? I, it doesn't matter. You tell me who I can take. Like, I don't want to take somebody that... So, I mean, it's supposed to be at 11.15, but I'm, I'm going to get there. Like, I'm going to sit there for a while. So, it's going right. to be somebody that's not going to, like... So, you can get Will... And Max okay. and Clay. Okay. How many more do you need? No, no, no. I just probably need like maybe two. Okay. Like his 13 pieces, I can carry some. They're cheese. looking at me now, going, but, "What?" But if I don't want to make them miss something if they want to walk. Okay. So, you know, okay. Just ask. She's back. Yay! Take a deep breath, right? You start feeling stress. Just take a breath. <laughs> Makes us feel better. Yes. Give us a moment to think, right? Everybody's breathing, so it doesn't seem weird to do, right? Okay. okay. We're gonna turn this on. All right. And then I mean if you're holding it down here, they're not gonna hear you anyway. So okay? Okay. You good? Yes.
Hi, my name is Caitlin Jones, and today I'm going to be talking about print media in the digital age with you. Now, by a show of hands, who uses social media? All right, and who reads the newspaper? And now I need a volunteer for the next question. All right, Eleanor, what was the last post you saw on Instagram? Thank you, and what was this week's newspaper headline? All right, as you can tell, social media is a lot more popular. For my, in, for my project, I interned at a print media company and a social media company. I then used what I learned to help my high school's newspaper program. For my quote of quality, I chose a quote from Taylor Swift. And I know that may not seem as serious, but the quote really spoke to me throughout the project. It says, you can't have a better tomorrow if you keep thinking about yesterday. I knew throughout this project that there would be a lot of setbacks and difficulties, and I wanted something by my side to remind myself that each day is a new opportunity to continue working. I put a lot of pressure on myself for this project because I used it as a way to figure out what I want to do for a career. I knew I wanted to go into communications, but I hadn't decided if I wanted to lean more towards print or social media. I knew that there were things that I would maybe figure out about both sides of media that could stray me away from communications in general, and then I'd have to start new. This quote reminded me every day that if I continued working, I could figure it all out. My mentors were Greg DeRazio at the Central Virginian, Mary Beth Bowen at Hive Creative Group, and Heather lustig Corinne at Louisa County High School. For my research, I started with the question of how does print media conform to the demands of digital media? That got me started looking at the differences between the two, and I was learning specifics about both print and digital. After looking at that, I learned that social media is much more popular than print media, which led me to my new question of why do people choose social media over print media when print media is written by journalists who use vetted sources? I learned that there were three main reasons. The first being that there's a lack of trust in print journalism. As you can go on social media and follow whoever you want, you share similar interests and opinions. Once you see that their post has your opinion, you claim that you trust it and that you agree with it. On print media, you read one article in the newspaper, and it's just something that you either agree with or don't, and you can't really change what you see in it. The second reason is that there is easier access to social media. If an event happens, it's much easier to go on your phone and see an immediate post about it than waiting until next week's newspaper to read about it. And the third is that there is a psychological affirmation aspect to it. You can go on social media and post your own opinion and get immediate feedback. On print media, you read the newspaper and there's no way that you can comment on that. Like I said, for my internship, I worked with Greg DeRazio at the Central Virginian. I would go in about once a week on Tuesdays specifically because the newspaper was printed on Wednesdays. Like I said, I am part of my high school's newspaper, but we are completely digital, so I was unable to work with the print aspect of it. I really wanted to learn how to work with layout, and we used a tool called InDesign every time I was there to work with it. I was able to work with everyone to make puzzle pieces, basically, to figure out what the newspaper would end up as. I also took pictures for the Central Virginian, and I wrote a few captions and briefs, which got published. I also worked with Mary Beth Bowen at Hive Creative Group. I went into this social media internship thinking I would know so much about it, because I'm a teenage girl who spends a lot of time on her phone. When I got there, I figured out that I was completely wrong. There is so much analytics to it that you wouldn't even think about. They look at you know, who looks at their websites and what website they come from before that. They look at how many views they get on a specific post and everything like that. And the, op like the meeting itself when I was there is a little weird because they'd all come together, talk about their different projects, and then they would go separate ways and work on their own things. I was unable to choose who I wanted to work with while I was there. Here in this picture, you see me shadowing a meeting with my mentor where she was talking with one of her clients about a project that she was working on. They were just comparing what they were doing as she was saying that she was going to transfer what she was working on to somebody else, and I got to learn exactly what she does. I was able to use both of those experiences to work with the high school's newspaper, The Lion's Roar. My goal going into it was to better promote the newspaper on social media and kind of connect the aspect of social media to the digital media. And on I also was able to make flyers, which you can see in some of the handouts that I gave you. There is a one for Sam's Stargazing Night, which is a fellow member's um, event that he was able to put on, and I was able to make a flyer to help promote it, and a hiking club form for a 
club sign-up day where I was able to help with that. One of my things that I did that I was most proud of was adding a widget to the website. I was able to work on a design draft where I would edit it and it wouldn't be posted live to the website. I then got it checked by my editor-in-chief and my advisor to approve it and it was posted on there. This is our Instagram profile where you can see it on our website. It has all of our posts and it has a link that takes you directly to our Instagram page. This project impacted me in a lot of ways. Like I said, I went into it looking at it as a how to figure out what I want to do for a career. While I was working with everyone, I veered into lots of different directions. When I was working at the Central Virginian, I decided I definitely wanted to work with print media. Then at one point, I veered closer to sports media as I was taking pictures of volleyball games and different events for them. And then once I got to my social media company, I decided that that was definitely the way to go. Going back and forth showed me that I still don't fully know what I want to do, which leads me to my future plans. I've been accepted into VCU in their journalism program and Virginia Tech in their sports and media analytics program. I have yet to decide which one I want to do, though. I for sure do plan, though, on continuing working with communications. Are there any questions? Yes. Working with the high school's newspaper program was really important to me because when I started working with them, when I joined the class itself, I didn't really think I wanted to do anything with communications. Just joining it for fun as another class to take opened my eyes to my love for communications and has fully helped me plan what I want to do with a career. Yes. So, we were watching the Oscars and Hugh Grant, kind of rude when he was interviewed on the red carpet. About three minutes later, my husband says, he's getting torn apart on Twitter. And I said, how is that possible? It happened three minutes ago. And already, word was spreading about how he'd been rude. What do you think are the, the dangers of, it's social media, obviously. I, I'm guilty too. Like, I can't tell you what yesterday's newspaper headline mm -hmm. was, but I can tell you what I saw on TikTok today. What are the dangers of that? That again goes along with the psychological affirmation aspect to it. Anybody can go on social media and post their opinion and get immediate responses. And that can either validate their own opinion or there are people who just like to argue on there. So I think it can cause lots of controversy as like, instead of just reading what's actually happening, it allows people to put their own opinions into it and start fights. Yes. So online print media is still written by journalists who use vetted sources, so it still can be accurate. Social media is more of a way to communicate. Anybody can make an account and say that they're using accurate information when they're really not. Journalists go through school and they are required to not have bias in any information. Um, I noticed that y'all have a couple of questions. What is a widget? A widget, okay. It's something on the website where it's like a little block, basically, that you can put on there and you can add the Instagram into it. You can add what day it is. So I could add a widget that says it's Tuesday or anything onto the website just to help design the whole thing. So every piece of a website is made from some sort of widget. So could you, with the widgets, would this be kind of like your legacy that Yes. And then I had another one, you know, as we talked about the differences between print and um, social media with the, the government talking about crackdowns and that stuff like on TikTok, that sort of thing. Um, does that influence like your decision to go into the social media fearful that, you know, potential of, you know, the government's, you know, big hand coming in and, or anything like that? Yes. So when I look at the differences between social media and like print media, Part of me wants to go more towards social media because I know it's gonna be more popular and it's gonna continue getting bigger. But I'd say my main reason for still veering towards print media is just because that's what I know better. Um, I've worked with print media much more than I have social media, so I just feel more comfortable with it. Yes, cool. So I 
didn't get as much experience at my social media internship as I would have liked. Um, so I would say with the print media, it was a smaller print company in Louisa. Everybody knows everybody, so it was very easy to just fit in and kind of feel comfortable there. With my social media internship, it was more of a, they did their own separate things. So they would have their morning meeting and separate into their different projects. And so I kind of just had to pick who I wanted to follow. So I wasn't able to get as much as I wanted from that. Are there any more questions? Yes. So how do we as educators and you as a journalist uh, convince people that they need to look at the print media to get their information versus social media just to have fun and play? Um, I think that people are going to continue using social media just because, like I said, it's much easier and they don't trust it. Um, but I think if there was more promoting print media, I think it could get better. But there's also, like when I started my research and I had my original question, I was looking at why print media was failing and I saw lots of economic reasons also. So a lot of people won't pay for print media if they can just go on their phone and look at it. So, yes. Your research shows that people tend to gravitate towards like-minded opinions. Do you think that hinders Yes, I think that in part of my research paper, I talk about how people are unable to calmly disagree with each other now. They have such issues with having a disagreement that it turns into a big fight because normally they can just go on their phone and argue. So when it's an in-person confrontation, they're unable to handle it correctly. Talk to more people. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I would like to start off today with a series of a few questions. Just you can just raise your hand to answer. How many of you own a toothbrush? Okay, now, how many of you own toothpaste? Again, that's a lot of people. Now, how many of you visit the dentist? <laughs> Again, that's a like, good amount of people. And for us, this may seem like easy questions to answer yes to. However, for many Americans, that is not the case. Hello, my name is Maggie Shiflett, and my topic is access to preventive dentistry. 
American author Robert Collier said, success is the sum of small efforts repeated day in and day out. I found that this quote was helpful going into my project because just the thought of a senior project was so intimidating, but I realized if I broke it into small portions that I could do every day and weekly, that would become less intimidating and more manageable. An interesting thing about this quote is that it can also be related to dentistry. With small efforts every day, like brushing your teeth and flossing regularly, you can have a success with your oral hygiene. And starting as a child, I knew I wanted to go into medicine, but I never knew where I wanted to go. But when I remembered how my parents instilled these values of caring for my teeth and wanting good oral hygiene, I thought of dentistry as a career. My mentors in my project during my internship were Dr. Lawrence Brannan and Mrs. Stephanie Harpin, registered dental hygienist. And in my, in my community service, my mentor was Mr. Lloyd Runnett, the director of the Louisa Resource Council. Dr. Brannon has been in dentistry since the 1970s when he started out as a dental lab technician in the Army, using that to help pay for his school. And Mrs. Harpin has been in dentistry for 20 years, starting out helping her father, Mr. Brannon, in his practice. I interned at Dr. Lawrence Brannon's practice starting in July over the summer. And while I was there, I wanted to learn more about dentistry and see if I would like that as a possible career. In doing so, I wanted to learn more about patient care and other ways it could be applied to other areas of the medical field as well. So going in there, I was there for about most of the day, so I was able to see a lot of different patients with varying conditions. From regular cavities to large plaque buildup, I was able to see how they were dealt with. While I was there, I was able to observe regular cleanings, x-rays, and I also was able to help in the sanitization process of the areas. I would take all the the room after patients left to sanitize it and take the instruments in the back for sterilization through putting them through high pressure in an autoclave to sterilize them and after that I would place them in trays like the trays seen up there for the next patients to use. I was also able to observe other processes in their office like they had a lab in the back which they used to create temporary crowns that I watched Dr. Brandon place later on. I was also able to interact with patients every day, starting conversations with them and just learning how to have regular conversations to ease their worries. For my community service, I knew I wanted to do something to help my community because in the back of my mind, I still knew not everyone could afford that dental care. So when researching what we had in my community, I stumbled across the Louisa Resource Council. I already knew they provided food objects and clothing to help low income members of our county but the thing that interested me the most was their dental voucher program. So they had this program where they would give money to low-income members of Louisa County that would help them afford dental care for any emergent services. And so when talking to my mentor, Mr. Lloyd Runnett, we decided upon a fundraiser to help their program. As seen on the right, that is a flyer I created for the fundraiser, advertising what we were doing and collection of donations along with a QR code to make it more accessible for people to donate. I also posted on social media, as seen on the right, to help more people outside of Louisa know about it. I placed the flyers around the Louisa County in places that would let me put them up and then posted a link on all my social media pages leading people to the Louisa Resource Council's donation page. From that I was able to gain $120 on that part alone and also 150 items with the Louisa Resource Council, consisting of 100 toothbrushes, and around 50 toothpaste things, and um, floss. Part of those donations were collected with the Louisa Resource Council at one of their events for the Santa Council as well, where they were at Cali Opie's restaurant to collect money through a raffle for a football, assigned football, and donations of toys and dental hygiene products as well. For my research, I wanted to learn more about why people couldn't receive care to dental, dental care. Um, through this, I found that there were three main categories that could be broken into, the costs, the location, and education. When thinking about costs, people simply could not afford or could not justify paying for dental care. While $100 may not seem like a lot to some people, at a certain point, $100 for regular cleaning becomes too much if they are supposed to go every six months. What I found in my research was that community programs like the Louisa Resource Council Central Voucher Program would be the best way to help people since they were localized and could be custom to what a location needed. 
In talking about location and geography, people were either located too far away from a ample supply of dentists or they did not have the transportation. Tying that back into cost, with the rising prices of gas, people did not have the access to make it to the dentist. In my research, I found the best way to increase access was through the creation of mobile dental clinics, such as the ones on vans and trailers you would see coming to schools. Those clinics are able to travel wherever care was needed. Finally, one big issue, especially in Louisa County, is education on dentistry. Students and people do not have the knowledge about oral health literacy. They do not really know what the care they need or are not properly educated on the importance of their care. During my research, I found that the best way to mitigate this barrier would be through integrating um, education in dentistry starting in elementary school, teaching young kids how to brush their teeth properly and teaching them the importance of care to further instill these values in their life. Throughout my project, I was impacted personally. During my community service, I learned that I would need to adjust goals and be flexible. While my goal was to raise 600 items for the Louisa Resource Council, I fell short. One reason I believe this happened could have been because there was not as much emphasis on care for dentistry, as, whereas emphasis for food items seemed to be more important. I also learned how to be flexible in my research. When I would stumble upon different topics, I would have to adjust my focus of my research sometimes. And one thing which may be surprising was I learned better social skills. <laughs> Going into my project, I was very scared of interacting with people, and I still have that fear, but during my internship, I was able to overcome it because my mentor helped teach me how to have good conversations with patients to ease their care. I also learned more about professional communication during my community service, where most of my communication was over email. I needed to learn how to write a proper email and how to make it sound professional and get my points across. Going forward, I plan to attend the University of Virginia in the fall to study biology. I plan on doing that for pre-med. And while I do not see dentistry as a career in the future, I am thankful my project helped solidify an interest in medicine and helped me understand that healthcare is somewhere I want to go in the future. I would like to thank my parents for supporting me throughout all of the times I cried over my project. And I'd like to thank all of my classmates for being there also while I was stressed and helping me out, as well as Ms. King for being there and my mentors throughout all of my project. I now open the floor to any questions. Yes, Ms. Weddle. How much of that um, bedside manner or professionalism that you learned at the dental mm -hmm. office I think I will take all of that with me because no matter what career in medicine I go, I will need that bedside manner to converse with people well. Holly? Um, since my internship was over the summer, one of my favorite conversation starters was about vacations and if anyone has been on vacation or had any vacation plans. Because from that, you could get a wide variety of stories from people. Yes? But I remember when I was younger, we used to have mouthwash that came to the school and we had to do the mouthwash. And now with um, the way education is, we're so focused on the commercial. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that is very important, educating patients on what they need and their health. And since it is not taught in schools as much, while there is health class, people still do not really understand what is needed in their health. And I think that is an important part of the medical field to have that outreach to children and people about what they need. Yes, Brooke. I would say yes, they do have an emphasis on that. However, their main thing that people focus on is their food. And while they do have this program, I feel a lot of the programs at the Resource Council are not promoted as well as they could be. They lack the promotion and 
resources because people simply do not know that they are there. Lots of people do not know that the Vintel, Vintel voucher program is there at the Resource Council. Yes, Mr. Harris. Um, how did you, uh, I know you just kind of have a quiet person, how, how hard was that to, to, to kind of put on more public facade? It was pretty difficult at first. I was very nervous going in my first day having to talk to people. But once I was talking with my mentor in my internship, she helped me like come up with conversation starters, and it became easier to talk as I went on with people. Like my second, you know, it kind of follows up with the education. Mm -hmm. um, how many people did you encounter that are actually fearful? Um, I did not encounter uh, that many, although I had two patients during my internship that were feel fearful of the dentist. One lady did have to go outside and convince an elderly lady to come inside because she was so scared of it. Yes? How were your projects distributed? So the Resource Council had their own distribution plan and they were distributed with the regular food items and other Santa Council items that went out for people in Louisa County. Ms. King. I would say definitely practice public speaking and just try getting out there and choosing a topic you like also makes it a lot easier to speak on. If it's something you like or you enjoy, it is so much easier to talk about it because it becomes more comfortable when you know it well. Maybe like six. <laughs> Any other questions? Get tracking. I do better once I just start
do it on top. You're, you're up there. Okay, I just checked. Okay. So why don't you do a little test run? Okay. So click it that way. And then click it back. There you go. It's, okay. It's so I got simple. it. I like that it's like a hearty click, so I can't. You no, know it's actually, yeah. <laughs> because it's, and clearly for us, the little clicky noise, I mean, it doesn't have to. Yeah. And then just remember to talk here so we can hear you, right? Okay. Because otherwise people are like, what's she saying? Right? We want to hear what you're saying. We're going to say. And then that's just for the, so don't walk away from that. Okay. I'll come back to you at the end. Okay. Yep, okay. As, as I'll get. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to begin today by sharing a fact that hits close to home. 22% of Louisa County residents are food insecure, which is twice the national average rate of food insecurity. This fact drove me to select food insecurity as the topic for my senior capstone project because I strongly agree with Norman Borlaug that food is a moral human right, and I wanted to try and help address the extremely high rates of food insecurity in Louisa County. I began my project by interning at Feedmore in July um, Feedmore is a nonprofit organization that fights hunger in the Richmond area. They serve 34 locales and distributed 40 million pounds of food in 2021. Um, I really wanted to work there because I felt like such a large organization that has survived for 20 plus years would really have something to teach me about effective ways to fight food insecurity. And my mentor, Timothy Bothy, the Director of Volunteer Services at Feedmore, was really accommodating and scheduled me to work in all of the departments of Feedmore so that I could get a sense for how the larger operation is run. Um, it was a little bit intimidating at first because I worked in a brand new department every single day. So I met a new supervisor and learned how to do new tasks like warehouse sorting, preparing food to be distributed by Meals on Wheels, which brings food to elderly homebound residents in the Richmond area. Um, and then working in the children's program where we helped fill backpacks to be taken to YMCA's in the Richmond area for their after school program. I found it really cool to see how Feedmore had been able to grow into something so large. They had partnerships with local grocery stores and bakeries and even with Grubhub to deliver food for free to Meals on Wheels residents. So it was really cool to see the partnerships they had formed. Um, following my experience at my internship, seeing how food insecurity is dealt with on a larger scale, I wanted to focus on what causes food insecurity nationally, and then why is food insecurity so high in Louisa County? Um, and I found that the three factors that impact food insecurity nationally are demographics, like race, age, and gender, income levels, and then also residence location. Um, in Louisa County specifically, and in other similar rural locations, I found that there are three factors that make it especially difficult to acquire food. Um, the first of those factors is distance. Um, many of you in here, myself included, have a 20, 30, or 40 minute round trip to the nearest food source. Um, so that adds cost to getting to the food and then purchasing the food. And then it also makes it difficult for people who don't have functioning cars or may not have transportation every single day of the week. The second factor that makes acquiring food difficult for Louisa County residents is choice. So even when you are able to reach a food source like a family dollar or even a food lion, there typically aren't that many options nearby. So residents are unable to do sort of a price comparison and benefit from lower prices at one location versus another. And then finally, residents um, face increased cost. Um, in my research, there was a common phrase used about rural locations. There's something known as the rural markup where typically stores in rural locations are smaller because chains don't find it profitable to open, say, a superstore Walmart in a low-density population area. So they typically have larger overhead costs. Items are so, um, sold in smaller amounts, so consumers don't benefit from bulk discounts. And also there is additional cost in transporting the food to these retail locations. So our most vulnerable residents are paying extra at the checkout versus a resident in a suburban or urban area. Oh, sorry. Um, 
After my research, I continued with my community service at the Louisa Resource Council, which is a nonprofit organization that helps residents of Louisa obtain everything from food to medical supplies to dentistry and um, car repairs. My mentor for my research project, or for my community service, was Lloyd Runnett, the director of the Resource Council, and he allowed me to sit in on budget meetings, attend a fundraising event, um, and then I worked in the food bank every Thursday from September to December, um, getting to see how the operation is run, helping distribute food, um, helping people sign up for programs to help them get food assistance. Um, I really found that super fulfilling um, because I got to be one-on-one -on -one with the clients that were getting assistance um, versus at a larger operation like Feed More where it was more important that we make sure we turn out the food in proper volumes. There wasn't as much face-to-face -face contact. Um, following my time in the food bank, I felt that I had identified an area of need in the Resource Council with the Children's Feeding Program. Um, I saw lots of kids coming to the window with their parents, receiving bags of food, and I asked Mr. Runnett about what it looked like to get supplies for that program, and he told me that there had been um, an increased number of children receiving assistance from this backpack program. It's known as the backpack program because typically during non-COVID years, backpacks of food are sent home with kids from their schools, um, and there had been an increased demand for those backpacks during COVID, um, and yet, Typically, um, those items are more expensive and don't always come in with a consistent supply um, because typically you want items that are familiar to kids and that they are comfortable eating. And the Resource Council can have sort of a variable supply of food because it is dependent a bit on the distribution center for the Walmart and Zion. So a lot of times it's what they have available to donate. So consistency is difficult. Um, I ran a food drive February 6th through the 10th to collect the items that the Resource Council needed for their backpack program. Um, I distributed flyers to each student in Louisa County. Um, I set up distribution boxes at each of the schools and I partnered with the LCPS social media as well as um, getting on the Louisa County High School announcements each day to raise awareness about the drive and the items that we needed to donate it. And it was extremely successful. We collected 3,867 pounds of food in that week, which blew me away. I was really amazed by the generosity and the support from everyone in the community. And then I also, it was really amazing to see how many people wanted to contribute if you could give them some way to help. Ms. Sharp in the front office, for example, when I came to her and I said, I need to print 5,000 flyers, she said, all right, let me get my keys. And we went right ahead and we did that. So that was amazing to see how many people, if you could, if I could be the organizer and the person willing to put in the footwork, were willing to help be a piece of the puzzle and make that happen. Um, from this project, I have a renewed interest in public policy. I've been planning to attend a four-year university and study either psychology or business, but I am now considering either a minor or perhaps a double major in public policy because I've seen the direct correspondence between things like inflation and the ending of additional SNAP programs that were um, put in place during COVID and the amount of clients that we saw at the Resource Council. Um, so I got to see the direct impact of decisions being made in Washington with new faces coming to the window or more people coming back for assistance that had been able to get off of it for a while. Um, oh, and I'd also like to mention that during this project, much like Maggie mentioned, I really got to see how brave I could be. I had a lot of meetings where I would sit down with an administrator and say, I need to put boxes in all of the schools or I need approval to run this program. And everybody was really accommodating, um, but it took a lot of courage to be able to go in and ask for that. Um, and it was really fulfilling to be able to do that. Um, I'd like to thank my parents um, every time I showed up with thousands of flyers to sort, they put up with my craziness. Ms. King was an amazing support system, and I'd like to thank my mentors for being willing to let me take on the program that I assisted with. At this time, I'm open for questions. Yeah? Uh, um, I saw that you, know, you mentioned in the uh, Richmond area uh, with the feed more. Mm -hmm. um, 40 million pounds yeah. in 2020. That means you know, there's about a million people, so 40. 40 pounds per person living in the Richmond metropolitan area. Yeah. Were you surprised at the widespread extent that 
people. Yes. So they even bring food to people in Goochland, so pretty close. We are a little bit outside of their range, but they do actually donate some food to the Resource Council. Um, and it did kind of blow my mind when I got there because I had heard all the ads about Feed More, so I knew they were large. But I saw at least six different warehouses while I worked there, and that wasn't even all of them. And they are currently, they just finished fundraising to move to an even larger compound. So it was really cool to see the scale, um, especially since they started with a few donations and a few volunteers, and now they're massive. And, um, you know, now that, you know, um, I know there's always you know, been this controversy about calling Music County a food desert. Mm -hmm. Um, we just had a grocery store close here in town yep. on Saturday. So now we're down to three grocery stores for 40,000 people. Hmm. Um, what do you think the, the impact of, of fewer food choices will be for people that are hungry? It just makes it even more difficult to get food. And then the options that remain, again, like the dollar stores, I believe upon checking we had five um, value locations in Richmond and Mineral. Typically, there's less produce, less healthy choices. Um, and when I researched this, according to the federal government, a food desert is anywhere that you're eight miles or more from a food source. So um, that's actually most people in Louisa County. I wasn't able to get a specific number. Mm -hmm. But um, it's definitely going to make it even more difficult for people to acquire food. Yeah? So we did a mix of kid-friendly items and nutritionally important items. So I asked for things like even Pop-Tarts, which maybe wouldn't be considered the most nutritionally important, but kids will eat them. And then we asked for things like canned chicken and pasta that would be more nutritionally appropriate for kids. Yeah? It was... The hardest part, again, is part of what inspired me to work with the children's program was seeing especially the little kids or the elderly come and get food assistance because you know that this is a situation that they're in and it's sometimes beyond their control. Um, but it was, it was a widespread group, all ages, all ethnicities, and it kind of drove home for me how it can, a lot of people, it's just, they're just one thing away from it. So that kind of made it seem like it can happen to anybody. I honestly I am not sure I know that we have annual drives like um, F FCLA and other programs run them during homecoming week or other um, items there um, I would either hope that we could add spe children specific items to those drives or just keep it a priority um, unfortunately or fortunately I will not be here to continue No. But the food drive you did was specific, like, we are looking for peanut butter, we are looking for, you know, I think, I don't know, I feel like that could, those parameters I think that you set up were really important. Yeah. So that we're not just giving, but we're giving with a purpose. That was actually something I was a bit nervous about is, will people donate if they can't sweep the back of their pantry into a bag and just bring it if they have to have specific items? Um, but that was part of why it was important to reach out, especially to parents, because they're the ones often doing the grocery shopping. But I think it helps fill specific holes. Okay. I think that that sounds like an amazing thing to do. I think it's harder to implement in practice because grocery stores still have to make a profit, and so you can't always um, force them to open where you need them. That's often the issue with urban food deserts, is if the store doesn't see, to see a profit, they don't come. So you can open a food pantry or something like that, but then that requires community support, and oftentimes the community you're supporting may not have the resources to run their own bank. So that may be difficult, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Um, something I really liked about Feedmore was they tried to decentralize as much as they could. So the central warehouse processed a lot of food because it was an urban area. But they would, some of the meals that I helped package um, at one point got sent to different areas of Chesterfield or different areas around Richmond. So there was a lot of emphasis on bringing food to community centers and areas where people are located. And I know in Louisa, um, a lot of our churches have food pantries. Um, having a pantry at our schools is a big deal. Um, just getting food closer to people is perhaps the biggest thing that I think they did really well. I think, again, breaking things down into small steps because when I, I, I had a part of my project where I had planned to do something and then it didn't work out and I had to do something else fairly swiftly and that was terrifying to think that I was gonna essentially restart a section of my project. But um, I sat down and, and, and I made a plan of like, this is what I'm gonna do on this day. This is what I'm gonna do on this day. And sometimes it was hard to adhere to that. You do have to be a little bit flexible um, but it made it seem less like a massive undertaking and more like tomorrow I'm going to call this person and then the next day I'm going to set up this box and it just kind of went from there. Yes. So I, I emailed with all of them um, just because I wanted to make sure that they knew this was coming and that they could be prepared and I had a, a liaison at each of the schools they assigned a person who was in charge of counting items and communicating with me to make sure that I had that all um, categorized. The in-person meetings that I had were with Mr. Downey and Dr. Poloni just to make sure that this was okay to do countywide and then also because I was going to be at the high school, if it was okay for me to run that. Yes? I, I did. Um, Yeah, and I, um, I asked the executive assistant at the Resource Council for the specific items that she wanted and that they needed, um, which again was the goal was to make it targeted. Um, so I do have that list. If anyone would like it, um, I'm happy to provide it. Any other questions? Sensitive. It is. This was not the clicker I used at pr practice. No, because that one was horrible. <laughs> Why would you give me this one? Because this, this one actually didn't work. So you don't have to leave your finger on there. Just leave your finger yeah. down here. Yeah. And then so when you're ready, to just go for a click. And you hear a click. Yeah. And then you know you're sharing your story, right? Yeah. You have worked hard. You've done your part. She's prepared you well. If you, if you forget something, just go no. on. You don't know. Yeah. I don't know what you're yeah. doing. Right? So you just share whatever it is. Okay? Is that yeah, no, I, no, I was just... Okay. Oh, very nice. You're good. You look very good. Thank you. So I'm going to turn this on. Okay. But if it's down here, we're not going to... Should I, I should hand these out first. Oh, you want to hand this out? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I fixed that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. It's a good project. You did a good Should we wait for Ms. Richardson to come back? Um, I think we got a couple minutes before you start. You 
guys are on the 10s. Yeah, I'm on the 50. Well, I think that it was supposed to be 40, though. I think that there was a oh, was was type wrong. It's okay. Oh, I sure did. That's I'm a lot sorry. of numbers. Because well, Neve was really nervous. She's like, oh. oh. Everybody else is. No, and I was no, like, no, 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 it's just it's a, typo. a typo. It's okay. Oh, uh, okay. So, so actually, we're going to be off on this a little bit. Right. Well, that'd be 40. Okay. So you probably won't have a bell interruption, but Madison might. So maybe we could just take a break, a little break. Yeah. We, to let we, the bell go, and then. Oh yeah, because the bell rings. Lunch. The bell would ring at eleven. Eleven. Oh five. Seven. Is it a five? Yeah, I think it's a five. Okay. So yeah, we can take a break, and then that way it, let it the won't. Bell ring. Mm -hmm. And then let's make lunch. Give me a few more minutes for lunch. Take it here. Mm -hmm. yep. Is that okay? Yep. The handle is perfect. See. You Unless you want flexible. a little break now. Yeah. You want a small break now. It's completely... Would you rather have a five-minute break now? Oh, I can do... Well, I mean, will it interrupt me? Will the bow interrupt me if I have a five-minute break? See, if we give you... If we take a five-minute break now and you don't start until, like, 10, 45... No, he would still no, be yeah, done. Yeah, still be good. He would so still be 11 done. 11.05. Before 11.05. Yeah. So maybe that would work. Would that mm -hmm. work better? Give you a little break? Yeah. Or, or is that going to shut I'm, you up? I mean, I'm ready to go, but... So you want to go? Sure, yeah. yeah. It's hard to get yourself all pumped up and then be like, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, minutes. actually, okay. I can just say. So you want to hand out your stuff? Yeah. And I'll, give, I'll, I'll give this to you. Okay. Hi, how are you? <laughs> yeah, actually, I saw signs up for this. Yeah. 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 Oh. yeah. Hmm. <laughs> You're just sharing your story. I'm telling this king that. I'm telling you both that. It doesn't have to be perfect. So, okay, I'm going to turn this on. You want to hold it around, around here? Yeah. Okay. And just share your story. So, imagine you're going to open a business, any business at all. How would you advertise the business? How would you spread the word? How would you make a profit at all? These are the same exact questions I asked myself going into this project. Hi, my name is Caleb Saul. Welcome to my 2023 Senior Capstone Project titled Local Business Marketing. Now you may be wondering, what kind of marketing does this entail? Well, I'll get to that in just a second. First, let's look at this quote by Steve Jobs. We're here to put a dent in the universe. Otherwise, why even be here? This, as some of us may already know, Steve Jobs was one of the most prominent figures in the technology industry. He's one of the founding fathers of Apple, 
And this quote by him embodies the exact mindset students like myself need for a project like this. We can also use his company as an example. How did Apple become so successful? Well, it was through their product placement on places like social media platforms. We can, we can, also, use, we can also use this as an into my project. Um, I, I, use, I followed uh, Steve Jobs' Apple, company Apple by using marketing techniques like he did. So I used local business marketing. So large businesses like Wells Fargo and Sheets would already have dedicated marketing teams and would have little to no use for an intern like myself. So instead, I would need to take to sm the small businesses of Louisa like Strange House Skate Shop. Strange House, I've been, I went to Strange House Skate Shop once before just to buy a skateboard and the owners of the store were the most hospitable people ever. Without hesitation, I knew I wanted my internship to be here. Unfortunately, the owners of the store had no interest in traditional social media platforms like Instagram. Instead, I would need to take to other forms of social media like a website. Well, unbeknownst to me, however, the, the Oh, Strange House Skate Shop sold more other things than skateboards and skate associated items. Strange House Skate Shop also sold handmade jewelry through one of the owners of the one through a company called Baki, which one of the owners of the store also owns. My goal of this project was to create and design a website for Baki. Um, Although I have little to no experience designing a website, well, especially for a business, I want, but I, I wanted to make this look as professional as possible. So I took to two students in particular who have designed websites before for their own personal businesses, one of which used Wix, a browser-based free online software that allows you to create a website. This was perfect for a project like mine because one, it was free, and two, Small businesses like Strange House Skate Shop would not want to maintain, would not want the cost to maintain a website like, like a professional one. Now let me introduce to you the long-awaited mentors. This is Ms. Margaret Ann Narinsky Molina, my, and, and hiding in the back is Mr. Frank Molina. These two have been business owners since 2003, where they opened their first online skate shop and in 2010, they opened their first brick and mortar here in Louisa. Ever since then, their business hasn't stopped growing and it's been amazing ever since. These two have guided me through what it, what it takes to be a business owner as well as what it takes to open a business. It's important to note that Miss Margaret Ann is also the one who hand makes all the jewelry found inside the store and on the website. Now, the overall goal of marketing is to create attention for a business. Sometimes just a small amount of attention can go a long way for a business. Even businesses on, a, on the brink of closure can, can be revived with a little bit of attention. This is exactly what happened in my community service. My community service focused on the, the restoration of the Goochland Skate Park. And as you can see in these photos, The park was in less than ideal conditions. Needless to say, the park had, was crawling with safety hazards. There was rusting, wood, rusting metal, rotting wood, and nails and screws laid all over the ground. Now, my goal for this project was to restore the former glory of, this, of the Guchen Skate Park. But first, I would need to start with what's inside the skate park, the ramps. But, but let me introduce to you the people that made this all happen. This is Mr. Matthew Parker, the General Services Facility Supervisor for Goochland County Parks and Recreation and my mentor for my community service. Mr. Parker has been with Goochland County Parks and Rec since May of 2008 and was promoted to Mechanics Technician 1 in 20, 
2016. Just a year later, he was promoted to his current position. Mr. Parker has a background in electrical work and mechanical maintenance, which makes him perfect for his position. Mr. Parker has truly allowed me to put my ambitions to work through this project using his skills. Now let me introduce to you the rest of the team that made this project happen. These few people make up the small organization called Skate 522. Skate 522 and I shared similar goals in that we wanted to restore the former glory of the Gucci Skate Park. First, we needed to start, like mentioned before, we needed to start with the ramps. This is the half pipe. This is the newly built half pipe. Using Mr. Parker's construction and using Mr. Parker's proficiency in construction and engineering, we, we took to the largest ramp there, the half pipe. Since this was, this was coincidentally my large obstacle in my, in my community service, since I have little to no experience using power tools like a jigsaw and a drill. But with Mr. Parker's help, he taught me the basics on how to use these power tools and allowed this project to move smoothly. After a third party laid new concrete on one half of the park, we move into the event portion. Skate 522 hosted a skate day event in which, which was complete with food trucks, live music, and even raffles. The real challenge involved in this was advertising the event. Since Skate 522 has no social media page, nor does it have the capability to maintain one, it was, I had to take to other means of advertising. So I used flyers, like the ones in front of you, to advertise the event. I posted these around Louisa County High School to target the 14 to 18 year old demographic of people who would be more likely to skate. In the end, the event hosted hundreds of people and it goes to show that, uh, that, that you don't always need to rely on the power of social media to spread the word. It also shows that it also shows that in the absence of social media, this also creates new opportunities, but also difficulties at the same time. To tie everything together, I started researching why small businesses fail. Initially, I thought small businesses fail due to a lack of a social media presence, but with further research, this proved to be untrue. Instead, I found that, I found that small businesses suffered from federal legislation and the complexity of it. So I analyzed three government organizations, the Food and Drug Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, as well as three different types of businesses, S corporations, C corporations, and limited liability companies to determine that by simplifying federal legislation, this increases the amount of informed proprietors as well as as well as small business startup rates. Initially, I had doubts of my own abilities as I embarked on this project. As I overcame each challenge and faced each obstacle, I learned more about myself than I had ever, ever before. Not only did I learn technical skills, like the ones taught by my mentors, like how to use a power, like how to use a power drill and how to use a jigsaw, and how to, how to even create and design a website. I also learned critical communication, professional, and time management skills. Ultimately, BRVGS has allowed me to surpass my limits, and I will forever be grateful for these valuable skills. I, using these skills and knowledge that I gained from this experience, I, tend to, I, I plan to attend James Madison University to further my education in marketing. I would like to specifically thank Ms. Shannon King, Mr. Matthew Parker, and Ms. and Ms. Margaret, Mr. and Mrs. Margaret, Mr. and Mrs. Molina for their involvement in this project. I could not have done this without you, so thank you so much. Lastly, are there any questions for me or my about my project in general? Cool. Well, I, I've always had an interest in skateboarding. I recently got into skateboarding in February of last year, so I thought this was a perfect hobby to focus on. And since 
uh, it was hard to find a connection between the skate park and the skate shop uh, using marketing. I thought I would take to the project itself as in like fixing up the skate park to market that rather than, mar rather than marketing a event for skating. Yes. Yes, so this project was funded through uh, Gooch and County Parks and Rec. Um, one, the concrete that was laid was all paid for by Gooch and County. Skate 522 is also fundraising for uh, phase two and three of the park. So phase one was just the concrete and the ramps provided inside of it. And, but there's no really real way to monetize like, like admission to the park um, since it's a public space that Gooch and County has to do it for the public. But um, I mean, obviously they're not obligated, Gooshin County is not obligated to do it, but since there's such, been such a community outreach in, recently, um, that they're, they're promoted to do it. As, and Skate 522 also provided funds from their fundraising to um, fix up the park. <laughs> Go ahead. What, what do you find the most challenging for you? Besides, I mean, like obviously the physical school and so forth. Yeah. Um, it was rather than like find like one thing in particular it was more of like connecting everything um, because I initially went in I wanted to focus on the skateboarding aspect rather than the jewelry aspect because um, skate strange house skate shop has a pretty dated website um, it they, they as, as I mentioned before they opened their website in 2003 so it's nothing like a modern website it's very um, it's very old um, so I, I wanted to connect more of the skateboarding to this, but uh, I had to go a different direction. So that was probably the biggest challenge, just connecting everything and making it fit into, into each other. Yes, Ms. Christian. So, I mean, it was bad shape, the mm -hmm. skate park. Did they have fixed it by the end? Yes, they, they were already planning to lay the concrete and um, Re rebuild the ramps in the park, but the half pipe, I'm not sure about. The half pipe, I specifically did um, because they were planning on chunking it. Uh, so I, I was allowed to come in and fix it with the help of Mr. Parker to keep that ramp inside the park. Mm -hmm. Oh, straight 522. It wasn't that they were resistant to it, it was just they didn't have one. Oh, Strange House Skate Shop? Oh, so they had, um, they had in the past an Instagram page and Facebook page, but, they, but the owner, Frank, told me that they got a lot of backlash and a lot of hate from it. Um, it, was more of like, it was more of like a negative aspect of the community, and he doesn't like, and he told me personally that he doesn't enjoy the negative side of social media. So he rather refrained from keep staying on platforms like that rather than putting, like they have an Instagram page, but it's not regularly updated. Yes, Cole? Well, initially I wanted them to help out and they were going to, but before the skate day event was supposed to be a uh, skate competition, but it, that fell through and they were gonna be, they were gonna provide the trophies for that competition. But that fell through, so instead, uh, we bought the raffle prizes from Strange House Skate Shop. Ms. King? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm 
it's really all about open-mindedness. Um, like you really want to, like you said, convince them. How how are you going to convince them to uh, go along with your plan? But you you really just have to show like your uh, your credentials, basically. Like show how this impacted this through like like social media. How social media page really like the analytics of it, um, statistics and that and that sort of thing. You really want to show that off before you like want to take anything in another direction so that they know like you know what you're doing, you know what you're talking about, and you know that you're a professional. Mm -hmm. uh, Wix does have its own analytical program, but it, it requires a subscription, so we're not able to gather the data just from the free, uh, the free one that I used. Ms. Harris. Yeah, um, why do you think Goochland is, is willing to put up with a skate park that's having 22,000 people at one county house in the summertime? And it seems like it really pushes the skate park. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the skate park's been established since 2004. So the, um, that's what I was talking about with the former glory of it. Uh, when they first built the park, there was plenty of ramps. There was even there was a mini ramp. There was a larger half pipe than even the one that I built, and so there was a large uh, following for that park. But as time went on, uh, the park de deteriorated. There was a lot of crime, like graffiti and vandalism, in the park because there's there was little restriction. There's no cameras there. Um, yeah, so the park de deteriorated over time, and they um, I guess the people who used to enjoy the park and the people who had kids in that park, um, they wanted to see it fixed up and pushed for a, uh, for a movement to fix the park. Oh, they have a sign actually that says that they're not liable for anyone, any damages involved in the park. You skate at your own risk. Yes, um, actually, uh, Frank Molina and Margaret Molina are um, pushing for a skate park to be built, and they have already uh, successfully, I think, secured land for the park. Um, it, although I won't be around probably for the building of the park because it'll take time to plan where it's going to be. Well, they have the land, but they'll have to plan what the skate park's going to look like. Like this, um, like mine. Uh, they had to plan, I was in the planning process with um, where the ramps are going to be situated and they had, they had many different designs for the park, but since um, the elevation is very flat there, they can only do so much. Ms. Watkins. So, I'm not a representative of your school district, mm -hmm. So the wood are for movable um, uh, ramps. So concrete would have to stay there. Like, uh, let me show you. So these ones right here, these are concrete. These are concrete stairs, and this is a concrete ramp. Ramp. These can't be moved at all. These are stationary, and you can only do so much with them. But with these, like the ones back here, these are wooden ones. These are wooden ones, and this is a wooden one. So. Skaters would have more freedom to move them around and create obstacles that they would like. Mm -hmm. How much was the uh, the concrete? Was so that, that just that third. I know exactly what it is. It's reaching. Mm -hmm. So the concrete, I didn't get exact pricing because I wasn't very. It was a third party, and I wasn't very involved in uh -huh. the in the pouring of the concrete. Um, uh, I believe the concrete ranged from seventy five thousand to one hundred thousand for just that portion because of the, it's because of, it needs to be uh, semi-permeable since the drainage under the park, uh, that was the main problem with pouring the concrete is because the drainage under the park will run into the track and field down below. Um, so it needed to be more expensive concrete. <laughs> Is 
Is there any other questions? Yeah, the questions for that's questions for easy. I just messed over my. Just slide your belt around yeah. just a smidge. There you go. Does that look okay? Yes, yes. it looks fine. They're not going to look at your belt. Okay. okay. But we're not going to start. We're going to go ahead and let that. We're going to let that bell. Yeah. Is this, is this is still on. Yeah, it's still live. Mm -hmm. So about what time? So when we get close to the goat time, we'll just clip this okay. somewhere up here. I'll let you clip it, but as long as it's like about here, you should be fine. And then the microphone, when you hold it, I think, are you familiar with microphones? I mean, just don't hold really. it down here. Okay. If you can hold it this way, so you're speaking directly into the mic. Okay. I've got it turned off right now because it was rolling up. <laughs> it was rolling across the thing, and you could hear it rolling. Oh. <laughs> changed engineering before I got there. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And now I'm in education. Um, yes, tech, fabulous. That is amazing. I'm so excited. Oh, my God, yes. Have you been able to do any drafting or anything here as a class? Not as a class, yeah. but I always practice in my day. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm sure everything's CAD this now at any time. A lot of it is. Yeah. I actually did take a CAD um, class mm -hmm. where I learned how to use Revit this past semester. everything and it's just it's interesting yeah it definitely must be with that perspective of having been here before all this is built what is the ding 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 bell it's the tardy sweep got it
architecture is not a business, not a career, but a crusade and a consecration to a joy that justifies the existence of the earth. This quote, taken from my favorite novel, The Fountainhead, encapsulates pretty much the basis of my entire project. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, but it is this view of life and of architecture that has been the driving force behind my developing design philosophy and what has led me down the road of trying to determine the convergence of architecture and well-being. The Convergence of Architecture and Well-Being. So, my name is Madison Metz, and here we go. So my specific research question was, how can architecture optimize human health and well-being? Now, going into this, I was surprised to find that hardly any research exists in this area at all. So my findings pretty much represent the ways that I applied the relevant psychological and physiological concepts to architecture. And overall, I honestly found the process to be thoroughly interesting and enjoyable. And though my paper is nowhere near a complete reflection of what my question asks, it is a start. So at the beginning of my research process, I interviewed Mr. Shane Powers, an employee of my mentor and founder of the firm Arch Wealth, which focuses specifically on design that cultivates wellness. In college, I think he double majored in both architecture and cognitive science, a really interesting combination and his insight was invaluable. He really helped to narrow down the scope of my research and he pointed me in the right direction with several things, which was really great. So here are my findings and framework. I determined that the main areas that architecture can influence health and well-being are in light, air, space, and acoustics. Specifically, lighting that endeavors to maintain one's circadian rhythm through organizing the layout of the building or house from east to west based on the room's activity to best capture the sun during those times. So for example, having the dining room face the west and perhaps the family room facing the west to capture the setting sun um, to cue one's body and like mind that it's like time to rest and go in for the night. And having bedrooms facing the east to help one wake up earlier and get one started for the day. And along similar lines, having light sources that change their color and position throughout the day to also match the sun's natural changes in color and position. And for air, having air systems that are clean and conducive to thermal regulation. So with maximizing fresh airflow by having windows and doors that are supposed to be open, uh, using materials that do not off-gas harmful pollutants, such as VOCs, which stands for volatile organic compounds, and which are pretty prevalent in building materials, and implementing a thermostat that matches the body's temperature fluctuations, which may be on the more architectural engineering side of things, but this thermostat would, in theory, um, get warmer as the morning comes and peak in the afternoon to sort of help one get started going um, and try to drop, try, kind of drop off while the day wears down. Um, and stay around maybe 65 at night to help one sleep. And that also kind of matches the day's natural changes in temperature as well. Um, and for space, creating spaces that connect with the nature and maximize productivity through bridging the indoors to the outdoors by having large windows, pan panoramic views, and skylights, um, and configuring ceiling height to match a space's purpose. As study suggests that taller ceilings help aid abstract thinking, while more shorter ceilings help the more analytical and detail-oriented thinking kind of relating to the scale of one's sensory field. And incorporating fractal geometry, which may be in the more interior design aspect of the architecture, but research shows that one's um, physiolo physiological stress is actually significantly reduced when looking at things that have fractals or self-repeating patterns as opposed to artificial objects or photographs. And also for acoustics, having spaces that are like intentionally silent. So there, so you don't hear like the mechanical whir of appliances throughout a building of all times, so that your brain can like actually decompress and relax. Because even if you aren't consciously processing all the auditory and visual stimuli, your brain is still um, stimulated by them. So having spaces of silence really helps one to just relax. So to visualize some of these principles in practice, here are a few case studies done by the AIA, the American Institute of Architects, which I'll touch on briefly. 
So this first one here is the Microsoft Silicon Valley campus, which has an almost completely glass exterior to allow in lots of daylight in the sense that one is almost outdoors and not in confinement. Furthermore, its multi-courtyard organizational concept in green space on roof connects individuals to the outdoors even further and provides easy access to sunlight and fresh air. And the second example here is the Candata building at Georgia Tech, which I find to be immediately breathtaking. As you can see, there is a real use, there's real connection to nature with its use of live edge wood throughout and its large windows and skylights. Along with its, um, along with its outdoor airflow and minimal use of VOCs that really contribute to one's physical health, its um, tall ceilings and skylights really make the space feel open and airy and helps to cultivate one's sense of well-being. So for a couple of days over the summer, I interned with Adam Sutphin at Sutphin Architecture in Charlottesville. <coughs> um, <clears throat> while there, I hope to learn more about his career as an architect to get a better understanding of what exactly the job entails. And this being the first time I had ever actually met an architect, the experience was profound. Without going into too much detail, the sheer amount of information that I learned over the course of those two days was very enlightening and gave me a vital insight into the field of architecture. Along with being shown plans into how to read and taught how to read them, and having all their layers of complexity explained, and visiting an, visiting an active job site, seeing the, previous, seeing the previously mentioned plans come to life, and meeting with the client, the contractors, and the landscape architects, and observing CAD programs like Rhino and SketchUp, being shown old archi architecture school projects, and seeing how one can turn messy sketches into something one can visualize almost as if it were actually standing. <clears throat> The conversations that I had with Mr. Sutton, the other architects, and everyone else I met were incredibly valuable. It was really neat talking to people who have quite literally achieved my dream, and being able to spend some time in an architecture firm and getting their insight into the questions I could finally ask was really, really great. So for my community service, I volunteered with Habitat for Humanity, which, as I'm sure many of you guys are aware, is a global nonprofit housing organization. And my goal was to learn some basic carpentry skills so I can get a better understanding of how homes are built. And though I did not have a mentor in the typical sense, I learned skills from project leaders and primarily contacted Rick Hayescamp, who was the volunteer coordinator at Charlottesville's Habitat Store. So for my first project, I helped to rebuild a porch in a holly grove. Some of the more experienced volunteers kind of took me under their wing and guided me as I dismantled the steps and put in the floorboards using some tools that I've never actually used before. We were there for about seven hours, but we had to reschedule another full day to finish due to unforeseen rot, which unfortunately I couldn't attend because of school. And for the second project, I helped, um, did a land, I did a landscaping project in Spring Creek where I and the other volunteers laid sod in the yards of a few recent builds in the, in the neighborhood. Never having laid sod before, I had anticipated some pretty hard work. But the task was surprisingly simple. All one had to do was grab a, grab a roll of sod, line it up, and unroll it. And we were there for another full day, but by the end, we probably laid about a half an acre of sod collectively. And for my final community service experience, I volunteered at Charlottesville's Habitat Store for a few hours, specifically talking with customers and spreading the word about the food drive, handling food donations, um, helping customers load things into their cars, um, assembling artificial Christmas trees, and even pricing rugs. Nearing the deadline for my community service hours, I was only able to volunteer there once, but it was a good experience, and I intend to volunteer there again in my future free time. So this project has actually been really great. Throughout the years, I've spent a lot of time practicing my designs, researching architecture, and trying to learn as much about the field as possible. But this project gave me the opportunity the opportunity to focus my research and actually connect with architects, both of which have been priceless and I can't guarantee that I'd be doing them otherwise. Also, the entire research process proved to be really valuable. I realized that elevating the human experience is indeed the purpose of architecture, quite possibly the fundamental purpose, from its most basic function as shelter to its highest expression as art, which ignited the development of my burgeoning design philosophy, and my research took on a whole new meaning.
also, in many ways, this project really forced me out of my, forced me out of my comfort zone and almost helped my transition into adulthood. I remember after finishing my internship, it felt very strange having to go back to school the following week because it felt like I was an independent adult, but also like I really belonged in an architecture firm. So <clears throat> my next five years will be spent in architecture school at Virginia Tech, and I am so, so beyond excited. Thank you. I know this project has been in the back of our minds since day one of high school, and it has really defined my senior year. So I appreciate you guys listening to my project. Thanks. Any questions? Thank you. I need that. <laughs> Well, at the start, I'll take anything that I can get, but I am definitely more interested in the residential side. It's, I feel like designing homes is a lot more intimate than like a commercial building, and I like that aspect of it. Mr. Harris? Yeah, um, explain to me again about the space side. So I think I could best achieve that through really efficient soundproofing and maybe um, using appliances in a home that aren't particularly loud. But like the purpose of that is so that your brain actually has a chance to relax because even if you like aren't consciously processing all the auditory and visual information that's coming at you, your brain still is. And it makes um, your autonomic nervous system much more excited and aroused. And Having spaces of silence would allow your brain to just decompress and relax, and it would reduce one's psychological and physiological stress levels. Ms. Weddle? Um, how would you apply, or which of these concepts would you be best at So I think windows are a big one, and actually the library is a great example of this, because it has these really big sweeping windows, and although they aren't like east facing, which would actually help in the mornings, like being able to see the rising sun, but that you still do get a lot of light, which is great. And also, I think tall ceilings is an important aspect in classrooms. Also, the library has a good um, thing of this, but um, yeah, I guess it kind of depends on the subject. So you could organize the rooms based um, like on their subject and have this, the ceilings be configured accordingly, but like I said, taller ceilings help aid more abstract thinking, kind of relating to like the scale of one's sensory field. Like the studies are kind of vague, but it makes it makes intuitive sense that um, like more shorter ceilings would help more detail oriented thinking because you're more more focused. While more um, taller ceilings help abstract thinking, while you're kind of thinking higher and like you see more things, you hear more things along those lines. But I also think incorporating more nature in schools is really important. Um, and light is another big one because some of the interior classrooms in the building, they're really difficult to sit through a class like for three hours when there's no light and it's dark. Um, and I think that having light and just like more access to nature and windows would help students focus and just overall sense of well-being during school. Yeah. So further in my career, I definitely want to integrate the two. Um, up until this point, I've really only been able to do the design aspects, like drawing on my own. Um, but I am definitely looking forward to the chance to actually like build models and really create something tangible out of like just drawings. Um, Right, so that's a good question. And I think that could best be achieved through maybe having some sort of interior garden where like you're gr growing plants, which would also help the air quality in the building. Um, 
but yeah, just having gardens and even focusing less on maybe designing the house with like man-made materials and perhaps using like raw materials instead to get more of that sense of nature into the building. But I think I would, yeah. This past semester, I did a CAD drawing class where I learned how to use Revit, but it really, it was just how, it, the class was just based on me learning how to use the program and I didn't actually get a sense of how buildings are, um, could be built. So yeah, I definitely would incorporate that in my education if I could go back. Any other questions? One hundred thirty-six point six two million tons of waste is landfilled every year in the United States. Much of this waste is comprised of food waste, which, when landfilled, it anaerobically decomposes and produces methane, a powerful greenhouse gas. Um, this greenhouse gas affects climate change and mostly affects developing nations in Asia and Africa. However, in nations um, like the United States that are developed contribute the most to the climate change. Um, one way in which we can mitigate our effect in, in such a topic is by recycling. However, in places like Louisa and surrounding counties, it is quite difficult to, due to the large distances away from recycling collection facilities and because of the low amount of education on such a topic. That is why I, the scholar Hernandez, decided to research on the importance and effectiveness of recycling. So in order to do so, I decided to um, intern at Vandalin Recycling Container Rentals, where uh, located in Troy, Virginia, where my main goal was to try to see the entire um, process of recycling from collecting the materials all the way into um, transporting them to manufacturers. I worked with Miss Jessica Brown. She is the assistant to the CEO of Vanderland, and her main job is to make um, presentations and propose new ideas on recycling. Just this past summer, she was able to get a new sector of the recycling branch um, processed. Now, Vanderland accepts um, plastic films like foams, styrofoams, and um, plastic bags. So while at was I at Vanderlyn, I was there for two weeks. The first week I was in an industrial area where I have never set foot in, so I needed to learn quickly how to make, keep myself safe. So for the first day of the first week, I attended a six hour orientation where I learned about all sorts of dangers, including nails on the ground and um, dust particles that float in the air. One of which is crystalline silica, a very small dust particle that um, is, comes from rocks and concretes that the facility processes. So in order, and silica leads to silicosis, it's an incurable lung disease, um, which can um, also lead to lung cancer. So one way in which we can protect ourselves um, and all the workers was to wear a respirator whenever we set foot inside the building. We also had to wear other personal protective equipment, including a safety helmet, uh, safety gloves, safety glasses, uh, safety vest, and steel-toed boots. 
So in my first week, I was on the sorting line where I tried to ask um, workers to see what types of materials they saw on the lines. Um, Vanderlyn mostly accepts just construction debris, including rooftops. They accept wood, concrete, and um, some PVC pipes. However, what they do not accept is municipal solid waste, which mostly includes uh, food waste and usually things found in plastic bags. So um, on the sorting line, I talked to workers and they saw, said, mentioned that they mostly saw what was supposed to be on there, but they also saw the first symptoms of the main problem with recycling, which is um, municipal solid waste, which is not supposed to be there. Um, this, especially the plastic bags that can see on, be seen on the actual sorting lines can get caught into the machinery, um, which must be removed and to be removed, all of the machines have to stop working. Um, so after that, I went on to my second week where I was able to um, work in the offices. I worked with Ms. Je Jessica Brown um, more in depth. She was my mentor um, and I was able to tour around the facility um, where I actually saw the problem. You see Vanderland has an actual collection area on the facility where they have containers labeled appropriately with the materials they accept. But some people misuse this and uh, instead of actually recycling, they um, uh, just dump their waste, which is harmful to both the recycling facility Vanderland and manufacturers because at Vanderland they have to pay more money to actually um, process it. And in manufacturing facilities, they have to reject it and um, because the impurity rates are too high, um, which means that all of the wastes are, um, are wasted, all of the efforts are wasted because um, all of those materials are sent to landfills. So in order to tackle this process head on, uh, I decided to enter or do my community service at Louisa County High School, where I targeted a younger audience of um, high schoolers who would soon become adults and have to make their own decisions on waste management and, and their general life decisions. So uh, I worked with Miss Kimberly Jenkaitis. She is the science teacher. She is also the Envirothon coach, and she was the um, former leader of the recycling program at Louisa. My main community service consisted of me placing four bins in every hallway on both um, all three floor levels, which added up to four, uh, 12 bins. They looked kind of like this and the ones up there. And it ran, the event ran for one week uh, where each bin would correspond to a different grade level and whoever collected the most um, won the event. So, but in, before I could actually do all of this, I worked with my mentor uh, closely to try to make, um, get permission from administrators, uh, make advertisement and communicate with leadership uh, to make sure that people knew about it and knew how to um, recycle appropriately. I made posters and also talked to the janitorial and custodial staff um, and um, worked with some of my classmates um, to try to make sure it all uh, worked appropriately. During the actual one week event, um, I was mainly responsible for collecting um, and counting all of the materials. I also worked with some of my classmates. And in total, we collected 1,300, oops, 1,392 items um, with an accuracy rate of 96.6%, which is much, much higher than can be seen um, in actual recycling um, locations and at Vanderland, uh, due to the fact that we only collected two materials, which were aluminum cans and plastic bottles. Um, uh, I also saw that people did not try to waste any, to put any tr um, just normal trash in them because they, it was a competition to see who could recycle the most appropriately. So with all of this knowledge of my internship and community service, I, brought, I narrowed, actually brought in my topic for my research paper um, from actual recycling to waste management, which encompasses landfilling, reduction of waste, um, recycling, and repurposing. My main thesis for my research was um, to look at the European Union and see what policies they had for waste management that could be implemented into the United States to try to um, uh, increase our waste management skills. One thing I found was that they incentivized recycling both in the individual and the community level. Um, for the individuals, they pay people every time they cycle. They give them a few cents, which um, gives them positive stimulus. And for corporations, they give them tax cuts if they recycle and to give them um, fines if they don't recycle. One thing that the EU still hasn't solved, though, is the problem of recycling solar panels. In the upcoming 20 years, solar panels will reach their end of life. 
um, and will become a major problem since there's nowhere to recycle them. They will all have to be landfill and have the potential to leak um, heavy metals into the ground. Shortly after I finished my research project, I was um, called on by leadership. They thought it was a great idea to have bins in the hallways um, because it is accessible to everyone. Right now we do have a recycling program, but it only is um, accessible to classes that actually volunteer for it. And so some students may not have any classes where they can actually recycle. So having bins in the hallways allows every single student to recycle whenever needed and leadership is completely responsible for this so the custodial staff does not have any more work to do. And this is uh, apparently, I think it will be permanent. I don't think it's um, seasonal, so this is great. Also, immediately after my community service, I conducted a survey on the student body to see how many people actually knew about the project and how many people had participated. From the people I surveyed, most of them knew uh, that the event was going on, but not all participated. This is mainly due to the fact that they did not have access to the materials needed to participate. However, this is actually more positive environmentally because they are reducing the amount of waste they are creating, thereby reducing the amount of energy needed to recycle their waste. So in the future, I hope to get, uh, use all of the knowledge I have gained from my internship, my community service, and my research project to implement it in my future career as a civil engineer. Um, I will be working on public transportation, and I hope that I can make public transportation that is run on, runs on green energy, that is made from renewable or recycled materials that are ethically sourced, and that is most importantly accessible to everyone. Um, with recycling and public transportation, I know that many people don't have access, and I, I personally think transportation is much more important than recycling. It affects people's livelihoods, their education, and just any recreational activities they want to participate in. So. Thank you for listening. Thank you for everyone that uh, helped me during my presentation. Um, do you have any questions? Holly. Yes, there was um, one student that actually donated um, around like more than 700 items. Um, we counted all of them and we took them to the recycling bin out back. Um, which was mainly those um, numbers were contributing to their senior class. That's why they won at the event, <laughs> pretty much. Any other questions? Ms. Weddle? So you had a lot of success by asking people just to leave cans and bottles. And I find that one of the frustrations for people who should be recycling at home but aren't is that there's too much storage. Do you think that... Um, recycling efforts would be improved if we just limited, I mean, I know you'd have to pick and choose, but do you think that more people would recycle if they had fewer choices to make if they went to the trash bags? So do you mean like um, that instead of actually having to sort it, they would just put it all together and I like... Mean that instead of saying, um, uh, here's where your bottles go, here's where your cans go, here's where your paper goes, here's where your newspaper goes, here's where your cardboard goes, like, Bottles and cans. Just bottles and cans. Oh, you know I mean? yeah. More people will participate if they only had to recycle two things. Yeah, for sure, because they wouldn't have to think about everything, and they would have more, um, like, uh, they'd have more incentive to do it um, when they have like fewer options. Miss mm -hmm. King. Mr. Harris. Yeah, um, uh, yeah uh, kudos to you to uh, going through a six-hour training session in industrial science. Mm -hmm. Someone who's done that in their past, I know that was uh, like watching paint dry. Um, but the jobs that you that you did in your internship, do you think they're actually desirable to the average person? Um, I don't think the workers there really liked it. Okay. 
Um, but, I mean, they made money from it. Um, I think the office workers probably like their job more than the workers on the sorting lines. So. Do you, do you see that, that type of work in the, and I'm assuming it was probably fairly low wages? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you see that as a, a deterrent, again, to recycling, the, you know, to find people to do those sorts of jobs? Yes, uh, I do, but there are other like forms of recycling, like you can automate the entire process, which I mean is more expensive, but if done on a larger scale, then it could probably be more efficient than having workers. And also you don't have to pay for the insurance and things like that. And um, can you explain to me what accuracy rate is when it comes to recycling? Um, basically it's um, the, like, the amount of materials that aren't supposed to be there, so like if someone just threw some cardboard and like plastic and where there should be cans, that's like, so how many of those there are compared to the total amount of items. So it would be, well actually the other way around, how many accurate are ones there and then total amount of items. So I had a 96.6% accuracy rate, meaning that 96.6 .6 out of 100 items were the correct items disposed of. So then, yeah. Work. Well, I think that um, one thing I could, would tell them is that they can have, even though it's like a very small action, they can have a larger impact when it accumulates um, towards um, climate change with the food waste if they reduce their waste or recycling um, with producing less waste which goes to landfills and they're just stuck there for hundreds of years um, not being used. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Yes, I think there's research, but I don't think like there's enough research on it. Um, there probably should have been research done beforehand, like when solar panels were being created. Um, so as to like think ahead of time to make sure that those solar panels don't create a massive waste like plastics are right now in landfills and in the oceans. Any other questions, Ms. King? Um, well, I would definitely advise to do it in the summer because I had much more transportation then, my parents had more time, uh, and I had more time to actually, like, more availability to be able to go places. Um, but if they don't even, they don't have that either, I still advise them to do it over the summer, but try to see if they can, like, maybe, I don't know, um, work closer to where they are, or maybe, like, um, try to see, um, get more opportunities from friends or family that w are willing and able to transport them. Since that, yeah. Yes, yes, I was, um, I got help from my parents to try to transport me since I don't have that. Yes, that is in the county. Yeah, that was one of my major setbacks, trying to find things close to me since I couldn't go large distances away. Any other questions? class and you just came in, come on up guys, there's lots of places for y'all to go in. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello guys, um, I want you guys to try and take as 
sticking out the resume to you. Um, this is part of my project. Unfortunately, if there weren't extras, you'll hear all about it. I have one of my own as well. Positive affirmation. Would you guys like to take a sticky note that resonates with you or take whatever you need? I have one of my own to give you some positive vibes. Okay. There's sticky notes with positive affirmations. Aww. Would you guys like to take one that you need or that resonates with you? I have my own too. <laughs> this thing. Hello everybody, I just want to say good afternoon and I want to take a little poll of how's everybody doing today? Good? Bad? Mediocre? I want to talk to you guys about teenage mental health. Um, as Ms. King said, I'm Amelia Vingler and this topic is extremely important to me because mental health I think is one of the most important things to take care of for yourself. I've always been interested in it. Um, I want to go into it as a career, hopefully. And as for teenagers, I think a lot of us struggle the most between school, all the different social medias, problems that arise from all of that kind of stuff. Um, and so I wanted to focus on teenagers because I think it would be most beneficial for us. For my internship, I worked at Santera Martha Jefferson with a social worker there, Ann Atwell. I worked with her to learn the ins and outs of social work and how that can be applied in the medical field. She works in the Cancer Center at Martha Jefferson, so she gave me a tour of the entire um, place and gave me kind of the rundown on how things worked what her office space would look like, things like that. One of her biggest things was she wanted me to know what it would look like for a patient and to understand that this is what they are going to be living for the time being and to really understand what they're going through and what they're going through emotionally 
I would have to see the inside and what that looked like for them. I got to meet with doctors and nurses there who shared stories, gave their insight, um, and just all of the different parts that go into just the cancer center. I didn't get to see the rest of it, although I would have loved to. One of the most interesting stories that I had was meeting with a physicist there who showed me the radiation machines. He was able to show me the computers, all of the really interesting nitty gritty and how precise they can be. And even my mentor, Anne, said she had never seen it before and seen what all of the moving parts were like. So it was an interesting experience for both of us. Um, one of my favorite things was that she taught me that listening to the people rather than coming at them with solutions is going to be your best bet to actually help others. I think a lot of us forget that there are people that need help most of the time. And to listen to them is going to be the actually beneficial part. One of her biggest pieces of advice was to meet the need. Some people don't need anything from you, and that's totally OK. And then some people are going to need a lot of support. Maybe they don't have it from other family members, which also leads into my personal significance and my personal impact. The cancer center was actually where my grandmother was treated. Um, she had cancer three times. Um, the final time, she passed away in 2019. So it, coming in with that perspective of knowing what it looked like for her also helped me to understand what it would look like for other cancer patients or other people that were in need in Santera Martha Jefferson. Um, I got to take away a lot of listening skills and um, advice that will be applied in my future career, such as meeting the need, understanding and listening. I think those were the biggest skills, along with professional communication and speaking with professionals that know way more than I do and being able to listen to them instead of being a teenager and being like, I know more than you, it's fine. For my community service, I took those skills and I applied them with Kendall Britt here at the school. Um, our original plan was to make a month of self-love. We wanted to promote students to have self-love and to be kind to themselves and others, which can benefit um, their mental health as well as others. The main part of my project was a sticky note wall full of compliments, affirmations, like the ones that you guys have received. And we told them, take what resonated and take what they need. And if they wanted to take one that they thought m would benefit somebody else, to take it and give it to someone else as well. The other parts of my community service that have not occurred yet are reading to elementary school students at Thomas Jefferson, um, Trevilians, and Moss Knuckles, all of which will be going into social emotional and teaching them to be kind to others and to work as a team. With the sticky notes, however, I saw a huge impact from seeing students coming up multiple times and getting so excited to pass them out to their friends, other teachers. Um, at the time, it would have been a rough week, so everybody kind of needed that pick-me-up. And so many students were like so much happier. They had a big smile on their face, getting to see some of the funnier sticky notes, some of the kind words that just gave them something to look forward to. And I also talked with some of the people that helped organize it, and they were very happy to see the smiling faces and the happiness that it gave to others. And they benefited from it, and they were feeling better mentally. My research topic was how COVID-19 affected teenage mental health. In that, not only did I find that anxiety and depression rates have risen, I found that other disorders like headline panic disorder, post-traumatic stress, and other signs of abuse um, became more prevalent, as well as using drugs, alcohol, and vapes to self-medicate all of those issues. 
Um, one of the really main takeaways was that social media was not a benefit to us during COVID. It actually caused more damage, especially with eating disorders and similar things like that. My advice to upcoming seniors or just students in general um, is to start early and take every opportunity that you can because it will benefit you so, 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 so much. And my advice is to keep your mental health in check. Mental health should be over top of everything else. Coming from somebody who struggled with my mental health over the course of my project, I wasn't able to get some things done or fully take grasp of the opportunities that were available to me. So keeping your mental health in check over all else is extremely important. My future plans are to go to VCU for psychology and to continue um, down the track of social work or probably more likely a school psychologist. Um, in fact, I would like to come back here or in the area to become a school psychologist and to help students in my own community. I would also like to give a thanks to my family who are here today um, for being my support system, my friends, for always giving nice input to help me out and just keeping me sane. Miss King for providing an awesome support system and all the other people who have helped me, including my mentors. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Mr. Harris? Um, you said, uh, what is, I thought it was kind of unique. I never had you know, heard about social work and looking at you know, what it's like to be a patient. And you said you talked to, to multiple different um, people, you know, doing different things. Which, did you find that any of their reflections of what it meant to be a patient changed on what their different job was? Unfortunately, I did not talk to them about patients. I more asked them about um, their kind of journey and what they did specifically. Um, but the overall, um, premise of what they had told me was that mental health is extremely important and the work that Anne does with her patients is fantastic and it actually benefits them because they're able to do what they need to do without the stress of, oh, like I don't want to cause this to be a problem. Um, <clears throat> what, did, what is the main thing that you found out? The main thing I found out of what it was like to be a patient is that this is your life for the time being. Normally, it's not going to be an easy recovery. Um, and a lot of them are grieving. They're very, they're struggling a lot. And some people need a lot more support and help than others. Um, so coming from the standpoint of a social worker, you have to understand that you don't understand the full extent of all of their struggles or the grief that they may feel. So it's important to listen to them and try to understand and put yourself in their shoes where they're coming from. Model? Um, what is headline panic disorder and do I? Headline <laughs> panic disorder is actually, you see these headlines all of the time that are panic inducing, they're these big scary things all of the time and eventually you become so decent, like almost desensitized to it that it causes a panic even though you don't necessarily need to have that panic, if that makes sense. Um, and what do you think was the most important, because I, I, the one thing I know about this governor's school project is that mental health there are times, you know, when the big deadlines come and, and, and am I going to get it all together? And I hear it in you guys and you're saying, well, how do I know I'm going to have a project? Or what was the most important thing you did to keep yourself mentally healthy through that? The thing that I did to keep myself mentally healthy is to reach out to my supporters, like my friends and family and Miss King, because I know that they're going to be there and help accommodate me to with Ms. King, plan for an internship, plan for my community service, and when there's bumps in the road, that I know that they are gonna be there to support me and help me out. Uh, Maggie?
I think one of my favorite parts was hearing stories about my grandma from all of these lovely individuals, doctors and nurses. Um, I got to hear some like stories that I've never heard because they also worked with her at Sentara. So they got to tell me she was such a kind individual or you are just like her and the fact that you are a bright, shining, just smile in the room. So, uh, Sarah. I mean, um, the, uh, I do. Um, one of the main things that I learned from Anne is that you don't necessarily have to have a workspace dedicated to meeting with patients. You can meet them anywhere, especially with a cancer center. It's hard to pull someone in for however long to chat about whatever's going on. So being able to just meet up with them and say in a school setting, in the cafeteria, sit down and say, hey, how you doing? Anything bothering you, anything like that, I think that would be a great way to implement some of the things that I've learned. Implanting them into my everyday life is definitely a lot easier than you might think. Being able to kind of remove yourself and your own biases, especially when you're talking with friends, is an important one because you have to be able to take a step back and say, this is what's going on. I may know all of these people and I may be a, may be a part of it, but I have to be unbiased and give my own advice if they ask for it. But the main thing is just to listen. Um, we kind of put in our own opinions and our own advice a lot of the times. So instead of doing that, listen and ask for them. To, like if they ask, give them advice, but otherwise just let them kind of vent is the main thing. Brooke? Unfortunately, because I was a minor at the time and HIPAA violations, I was not able to meet with either patients or families. But hearing from Anne, she has talked to many family members of the patients that she has. And um, speaking from my own experience with my grandma, she actually has this, still has a relationship with my grandpa, checking in on him and making sure he's doing well and all of that kind of stuff. Ms. King? <laughs> I think when working with students our age, you have to understand that things like bullying or anything like that is kind of all present with social media. There's not really an escape um, unless you completely dis like deactivate all social media, in which case then you're cut off from friends or family, et cetera. So understanding that they have problems that just are all the time, or social media especially, um, there's things like bad po body positivity or um, like unrealistic body standards or living standards that we, a lot of us struggle with, eating disorders, et cetera, from all of that. So understanding that that is an all the time thing, I think would be benef beneficial. Any other questions? Maeve?
<laughs> yes. Um, as far as I know at Sintera and Martha Jefferson, they do their absolute best to reach out with everybody and maintain those connections and maintain that um, kind of, the hope is a constant connection, but unfortunately there are not a lot of resources for social workers or psychologists, so I think a lot of the time they ask for um, outside resources like private therapists, private counselors to come in and help. Um, which is not always a possibility. Brooke? I do believe that that's a failure because obviously mental health is really important and providing that support is something that Sintera Martha Jefferson wants to strive for. Um, and I'm sorry that that was not possible for you. Um, sometimes resources just aren't available, and that's really hard. Any other questions? Absolutely. Thank you. Even after all physical and mental abilities of geriatric patients uh, tend to decrease, the ability for creativity and to create art still remains. Good afternoon, my name is Antoinette Dwyer, and today I will be speaking to you all about the impact of the arts on geriatric mental health. The overall quote of quality that I chose for my project is not until we are lost do we begin to understand, understand ourselves by Henry David Thoreau. I chose this quote because I feel as though it relates to your overall mental health Sometimes you may lose yourself or you need to take time to find yourself along the way. And I feel as though this quote kind of takes that whole segment of information and wraps it all into one. For my community service, I worked at Hospice of the Piedmont with art therapist Darlene Green. I worked with her from September to December. Um, I couldn't directly work with her patients. However, I created art kits with her and I completed art lessons. Um, and these went directly to our patients. Over the course of the months, I created over 100 art kits for her to take to our patients, and this in total just gave her more time to work with them on their mental health and to um, help them out with whatever they needed. So pictured here, here I have one of my favorite kits that I created. Um, these are garden kits, and Mrs. Mrs. Green used them with her patients as a way for them to connect with the outdoors. Because they're in hospice care or they're in facilities, they aren't really able to get out, outside as often. They aren't able to connect with nature. And so the art kits kind of gave them the opportunity to look back on nature, look into the, inside on themselves, 
and allow them to express their creativity. So I created these kits for the judges today. And so I invite you all to open those up and you can arrange the flowers however you want. Um, even though some of her patients were, al were Alzheimer's and dementia patients and they didn't exactly know uh, what was going on, they still enjoyed ar arranging the shapes onto the paper. Um, the, it kind of gave them a sense of peace is what she told me um, because the organization of the lines and the colors, it adds to the, um, over, it reduces anxiety in patients is what she experienced with it. Um, so I created several of these kits. A lot of the kits that were created were used sort of as keepsakes for the patient to give to their family members. So this is a clay heart kit that um, I helped her create. The kits contained clay, cookie cutters, jar lids that the patients would use to press down on the clay with, wooden dowels so they could poke a hole in the top um, so it could be used as a keychain or bracelet or necklace, and wax paper. So the kit contained everything that was needed for Mrs. Green to take to her patients, and they can do them in their living facilities, they could do them at their home, with their, in their family's home, wherever they needed to. Um, and so after the patient completed their hearts, they would take their thumbprints or their fingerprints and they would press it in the middle and it was sort of meant as a keepsake. They could give it to a, a family member or a loved one, whoever they wanted to, and they, they could then decorate it. Um, my main goal for my internship was just to help out in any way. I wanted Mrs. Green to have more time with her patients because art therapy is taking the art and um, allowing the art therapist to make the connection between the art and the patient, how they're feeling. And so any sort of time that she had that she didn't have to worry about materials, she could just take a kit whenever she needed and she could go. Um, and I feel as though I greatly achieved that. Uh, one of the most memorable times that I remember um, seeing my impact, I was working on Christmas ornament kits this was done back in December, or in November, um, and I was preparing them for the holidays. And um, one of the other art therapists actually came in and she took six kits and she was taking them to an elementary school because uh, she worked with some of her patients' grandchildren as a way for them to deal with their grief. And so the kids were making little ornaments for their grandparents. Um, and I feel as though through my kits that I definitely gave her more time and I made an impact in, on each of those patients' lives without even directly meeting them. For my community service, I worked with Mrs. Alexandra Labar. She is a art, uh, art teacher here at the high school and she is the leader of the National Art Honor Society. I created lesson plans to take to Louisa Health and Rehab Re Rehabilitation Center here in Louisa. Um, I worked with fellow BRVGS senior, Holly Wright. Together we set up the field trip, which took a lot of work. We had to get permission forms, chaperones. Uh, we had to find transportation for the students. We also had a lot of regulations because the nursing home still had um, COVID regulations that we had to follow, as well as rules that the volunteers needed to follow and paperwork. Um, and so we completed two trip dates with artwork. The first date was in October. We completed a pulled string art activity. So patients were given string, paint, and paper, and they would dip the string into the paint, and they would put it on the paper and fold it in half and pull it out, and it would create abstract shapes, which then they could then use to um, fill in. They could create different landscapes. They could create animals, whatever they wanted. And I remember talking to one lady, and she had a shape, and she's like, I'm going to turn this into a cow. And I was like, there's no way. That does not look like a cow. And she's like, yeah, look. And so she flipped the paper upside down and she gave it eyes and a nose and it really did look like a cow. And it, I just found it really interesting because I never would have seen that before. Um, and so during this trip, it was really interesting hearing all of their stories. They each had such wonderful stories to tell and they were all joking. And it was just nice to see how they took their work and they turned it into something that was their own. For our second trip, which we completed in November, we created uh, collaging activities. And so I spent time cutting up construction paper and magazine pieces. And patients took these and they created animals, they created la landscapes, plants, whatever they wanted. Or some patients even just took pieces of paper and glued them onto the paper um, in whatever style they wanted. 
I really enjoyed this trip. This was my favorite of the two trips. Um, I spent a lot of time with this one gentleman, and he was originally from Maine, and he was telling me about his stories in deer hunting. And so he was cutting deers out of a magazine, and he was gluing them to the paper. And he was telling me about his encounter with a moose once, and it was really interesting um, being able to hear about his life and his part of the story. Um, during our trips, it was really interesting being able to see how the patients and the volunteers interacted. Uh, a lot of patients ended up creating artwork for uh, nurses, for family members, for friends, and one patient even created a piece of artwork for a chaperone, Mr. Ryan. Um, and I really enjoyed seeing the interaction between the volunteers and the patients. They all had such wonderful stories, they had amazing jokes, they were uh, laughing with the kids, and a lot of the time the patients were telling me how great it was to get out of the rooms, how it was nice to see new faces, because um, especially because of COVID, it was, they hadn't really seen anyone else except for each other and the nursing staff. And so um, it was really great for them to be able to see new faces, to do something new, because they don't really have very many activity, activities there. For my research, I focused on how the arts affect geriatric mental health. Um, in order to do this, I looked into different research libraries and peer-reviewed articles from art therapists. Um, there aren't very many sources into art therapy. It's not generally a conventional source that is used, and there isn't a lot of quantitative data on it. The data that I did find um, proved that art therapy almost always helps um, in, in addition to normal treatment. It kind of gives patients a chance to calm themselves. It gives them a healthy way to express their emotions. Because I know a lot of patients struggle with that, um, with dealing with their emotions in a healthy way. And so um, it was just really interesting being able to see how it works, how it helps. And um, it was amazing being able to take what I learned and implement it into my community service. Going into my project, I had a lot of um, emotional connections. So I've always been a, love, a lover of the arts. Um, my mother went to art school for a year, and so she always implemented that creativity in me. And um, my grandmother actually had Alzheimer's, which um, I, worked, I looked into during my research. And um, as a form of her treatment, she actually used artwork as a way to help um, deal with her emotions because it's kind of a time of change. You don't really know what's going on. And it kind of gives you a way to express yourself and to really feel what you're feeling. Um, going into my project, I wasn't entirely sure whether or not I wanted to go into art therapy as a career. I was kind of bouncing back and forth between psychology and education. However, for my project, I, I've learned that I really do enjoy art therapy. All the people that I met along the way, they all loved what they did. They all loved their, their work and their jobs. And um, I want to be able to do that in my career. And I really love just being able to interact with the patients and to interact with everyone else. So um, after college, I hope to hopefully join the art therapy department with hospice. Um, going forward, I will be attending Virginia Commonwealth University. I will be um, attending their art therapy pr program with a major in psychology and a minors in art and dance. Um, and I will be staying for a graduate year, so I will be able to practice uh, psychology once I am out. I would like to say thank you to my senior advisor, Mrs. King, um, as well as to my mentors and my friends and family. And I would now like to open the floor to any questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Geriatric. Yes, um, so generally you hear about the mental health of like younger people, um, of teenagers a lot too because with social media. And so geriatric, which relates to older people, um, generally it's not very, it's not heard about very often. And so I kind of wanted to shine a light onto that because you don't hear about it. They're also going through a huge change in their lives and it's not focused on a lot. Yes, so um, with my internship, uh, I just I worked with the art therapy department creating art projects and kits. Um, however, when I turn 18 over the summer, I hope to go back and volunteer with their patients. Um, I couldn't do that quite yet because I'm still 17, 
and you, you need to have specific training, but um, hopefully I will be able to return. Yes. Um, you said you did over 100 art kits. Where did you get the ideas for the, the different kits? Um, so my mentor, Mrs. Green, she, um, she actually, she has different books and lessons that she's had before, so the, all of them were her ideas. Um, and I know she talks a lot with other art therapists in the area, kind of trying to figure out, like, this works with patients, they enjoyed this, was, this was something that was interesting to them, or that helped them with their nerves, or whatever it was. And um, that definitely helps. And then she also looks into um, different articles and books that she has found that just help her create projects, and then some of them she just thinks of on her own from her experiences with patients. Um, you mentioned, um, you know, I guess, you know, the, the, the hospice. And so, you know, perhaps, um, you know, with, with the hospice care, is it still, you know, most of my generation thinks of it as like the end of life experience and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Is it, it sounds like um, from what you were doing and, and talking about, it was more of a, is it, has it changed? Is it still just, you know, kind of exclusively we're just trying to ease the care over like, like the next, you know, week, two weeks before you die or is it more expansive than that? So. Yes. So um, hospice as a whole is mainly just end of life care. However, I worked with the art therapy department and so they kind of used it as a way to um, give patients a time to calm their nerves. Um, I know a lot of the projects that my mentor does are related to end of life care. Like she'll have them create scenery about what they think their afterlife will look like or they'll have them give away gifts that, um, to family members and stuff. And I know a lot of the time, too, um, hospice has grief counseling for family members, for children, for, gra for grandchildren. And so a lot of the time, she ended up working with um, the grandchildren. She'd go to the elementary schools um, to visit some of her patients. So um, while it does mainly focus on end-of-life care, there, there are different aspects to it now. I think it has expanded. Yes. What do we do to, that's heavy stuff. What do we yeah. do to keep your heart going? I mean, I, I just feel like there's so much grief that there's got to be a way for you to keep yourself from going on things that you can say. Yeah. Um, so I didn't directly interact with patients or family members um, because I am still a minor. I'm not allowed to. But some of the stuff was really heavy. Some of the material she gave me that dealt with the end of life care, it was really heavy. And so um, a lot of the time she would give me art projects to help me learn the psychology. They were, they were called art interventions. And so she kind of used the art therapy on me. She'd say, okay, I'm gonna have you do this. And she explained to me, okay, this is what I'm seeing. You know, how are you feeling? And so, I mean, I feel like not only was that a learning experience for me, but it also gave me time to really think about how I was feeling. Yes. Um, it was definitely rough at first trying to get everything done, trying to get on the same schedule because we were definitely on two different um, parts of our project. I know Holly had finished with her internship before I had, and so we kind of um, had to plan our trips around that. I know she had one or two trips before we started the art trips, um, and so she kind of started the community service before I did, and then when I was ready, I came in with what I had learned from my internship. Um, but definitely, we had to use a lot of communication. We had to communicate back and forth through email, through text, through phone call, whatever we needed to ensure that um, we were ready and that we were bringing forth the best projects that we could. Okay, go ahead. Um, so part of my research, I did focus on the socialization factor, um, but I feel as though the creativity kind of gives yourself, it kind of gives a patient a way to look inside themselves, kind of express how they're feeling, and being able to connect with the art therapist to tell you, okay, 
this is how you can deal with this, this is how I can help. Um, I feel like it's a combination of both aspects. I remember one of the articles I was reading about art therapy, um, when, the, when the term was coined originally in the 1940s, the connection between the art therapist and the patient was what it was all about. You wanted to, you wanted to see that connection. So I feel like it's kind of um, putting the two of them together to create a final product. So mine was specifically on art therapy with geriatric patients. Um, it dealt with depressive disorders, socialization, and um, Alzheimer's and dementia. So all basic things that you know a lot of elderly patients are affected by. And then I also went into the end of life care um, with art, art therapy a bit. And um, so it was mainly about art therapy with geriatric patients. I don't think I need it. I feel like it's going to make me too loud, and then I'm going to get self-conscious about being too so loud. The only thing I want you to do is really like pick somebody in the back, like Sarah. I want you to go to Sarah and say, if you can't hear me, I want to touch your ear. And then that will let you know. No, I'll talk louder. Okay. Okay. So I want you to do that. Okay. All right. If you want to come in and help Bob's talk, we've got some stuff in here, kind of scattered around. No, this is not mine. Uh, that should that should be me. Oh, right here. Oh, there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I think that I got the settings right. That my video should play properly on click. So okay. like, can you or Miss King stay in here in case it doesn't play properly? Okay. It should it should play on click, and it should let me it should let me switch it on click. But just in case it doesn't. Right yes. Uh huh. Okay. Perfect. Do you want me to play? No. I can't. If I because if I do, it's gonna play. Okay. Is that it? What is okay. it? This one? It's that one. So okay. Here do you think the sound levels are? Oh high yeah. High make sure it's all the way up. So we're gonna we're gonna stay here. I would turn. I would turn the volume up. Wait, wait. Volume. All right. Okay. Do you want to handle? Actually. You're Right here, because you're going to be using the system's volume, okay. so that's going to be. The they button. probably both have. To, they both probably have to be up. It's not muted. I don't know. So it's without it. Can I just? Can I, so like it the is. things I try to do on every film, where it's like, oh my gosh, it's not trying. Oh my gosh, I have a hug. Aww, and they're here with you. <laughs> do you want to do a quick? Or do you just want to adjust from there? Well, I'll do, well you can just, if, if there's no sound, then just turn if it up. If there's no sound, you'll yeah. see. Yeah. Okay. Ready? All right. Okay. Uh, they might not be ready. Okay.
Good afternoon. Before I get started, I would like for you all to hear about my project from the people who it impacted the most. How did you feel when isolated in your room was going to COVID-19 lockdown? Just felt like I came out by myself. Um, I would feel myself going back. Because you couldn't do anything. I mean, like, what do you want to do? As you can see, my project had a profound impact on nursing home residents. My name is Holly Wright, and my project is on caring for the social welfare of the elderly. Well-being cannot exist just in your own head. Well-being is a combination of feeling good, as well as actually having meaning, good relationships, and accomplishment. I chose this as my quote of quality because it really embodies the meaning of my project as a whole. You cannot really be as healthy as possible without having good, strong relationships to support you and your endeavors. My mentor was Rochelle Myers, the, the Certified Activities Coordinator at the Louisa Health and Rehabilitation Center. She's also a recreational therapist and a Certified Occupational Therapy Assistant. She was essential to the success of my project because she allowed me to shadow her and get an up-close and personal look at how socialization impacts residents. She remained my mentor through my internship and my community service. My mom is a nurse, and sometimes she will tell me about how in these facilities they cannot always have the activities and socialization that they need, and sometimes you can tell just how sad it makes them. Because of this, I decided to help mitigate this issue, first starting with Louisa Health and Rehabilitation. I shadowed my mentor as I worked to learn how to plan, organize, and supervise activities at the nursing home. At first, I worked alongside my mentor, and by the end, I was proficient enough so that I could do it alone, 
sometimes on days when she wasn't even in the building. We started with activities like bingo, and we also completed arts and crafts projects, a 102nd birthday party, and a tea party in honor of Queen Elizabeth. While I was not able to start as early as I meant due to unforeseen circumstances, I was still able to go three or four times a week from September through October to do these activities with nursing home residents. I also helped plan bigger community events like a resident Christmas party and a Halloween boo fest. For my research, my burning question would was, was how does socialization impact the mental and physical health of nursing home residents? My biggest project with my, or my biggest problem with my paper was organizing the paper to fit my thesis. But as, as soon as I accomplished that, I was able to write a quality synthesis paper that I believe accomplished my goal. While it is important to prevent the spread of disease in long-term care facilities, it is also essential to promote proper socialization because of the tremendous benefits on geriatric mental and physical health, and it is possible to do so safely. Nursing home residents spend as much as 60% of their day alone in their rooms. 30% of older adults reported that COVID-19 alone made them feel lonely, dramatically increasing their risk of anxiety and depression. Social isolation also creates health, negative health effects, including cardiovascular issues. Simply by promoting socialization, we can dramatically improve these cognitive abilities, including communication, decision making, and memory. It also encourages residents to participate in more physical activities, improving their immune health and reducing their cardiovascular risk factors. One care model known as the Eden Alternative, which focuses on providing meaningful relationships, has led to a 50% decrease in disease incidence rates, as well as a 71% drop in drug costs. Simply by following basic hygiene practices like washing your hands and when necessary, wearing masks, social distancing, or having virtual visits, we can safely promote socialization in these facilities. For my community service, I created a partnership between Louisa County High School and Louisa Health and Rehabilitation that allowed students to volunteer easily. Alongside fellow Governor School senior Annie Dwyer, I hosted a meeting with National Honor Society, National Art Honor Society, and HOSA students where we went over the goals of my project as well as the requirements. Starting on October 6th, I held my first community service trip where I set up different stations, including dancer size, balloon blitz, and board games for residents who could not get as active. Residents loved these activities and were so excited to get up and get moving, get out of their mundane day-to-day -day lives. The following two trips were with Annie Dwyer, where we did string art and magazine collage projects. The, these projects promoted creativity among the nursing home residents and encouraged conversation between not only residents and students, but even my chaperones. Mr. Ryan back here bonded with one of these residents over there uh, coming from Maine, actually. Um, I am confident that I had a significant impact on all of their lives because of this intergenerational therapy and how it allowed these students and residents alike to interact with groups that they do not normally interact with. As you can see by the video that I played at the beginning of my presentation, residents were so excited every time students came to volunteer with them and they loved being able to communicate with these new faces. In an open-ended qualitative survey that I sent out to students who volunteered, they all reported improved communication skills between them, them and the residents and also the students as they made friends with who they volunteered. I have worked with Lion Pride in order to ensure the continuation of these trips next year and hopefully beyond. We also had a trip on Valentine's Day where we hosted a senior prom in order for residents to get up and dancing with students who volunteered. As you can see, dancing is one of their favorite activities. I have always struggled with self-confidence and social anxiety issues, especially when it comes to 
leading in groups and forming these professional relationships. And throughout the duration of my project, I could really see a difference in myself as I walked into a room and took charge of the situation as I had to give instructions on how things were going to work. I also made professional relationships with my mentor, Rochelle Myers, my admin, Monique Bruce, and our principal here, Mr. Downey, as I worked to organize my community service field trips. I am confident that I will be able to take these relationships and skills into my future. I also love implementing some of the skills that I learned into my current job, and I hope to take these skills into my professional future. While I have not decided exactly where I am going to go to school yet, I will attend a four-year undergraduate university where I will study pre-med and then I will attend medical school. I would like to thank Ms. King for putting up with me throughout this project, my mentor, as well as the other adults at the school and at the nursing home who helped me throughout my project, including Mr. Ryan. I would also like to give a special thanks to the residents and to the Louisa County High School students who volunteered and made my community service possible. I would now like to open the floor to any questions. Ms. Wardle. Um, how, are you gonna how will these skills inform your medical So it will be really important for me to, especially as a surgical intern and resident, I will have to have the professional skills with my residents who are in charge of me, as well as the uh, staff at the hospital who will be in charge. Yes, I will also be able, I will also need to lead a group on my own because usually in residencies you end up with a group of interns that who you have to control and I will need to be able to lead them as well. Emma. Oh, yes. <laughs> So I um, mentioned the community boo fest that I did was a Halloween event where we contacted different vendors who would set up tables at the nursing home. We had some trunk or treat vehicles as well as many tables. Uh, I, along with Darren Coleman, we worked a face painting booth where um, we painted faces each of the <laughs> of residents, but also of community members. Um, each table at the event had a resident that they kind of adopted, and they kind of hung out with them at the table the entire time in order for the residents to interact with the students who were volunteering, the other people in the community who were volunteering, as well as the children and their parents who came through to uh, trick or treat and participate in the activities at the tables. 80. So you said your project was mainly on the socialization of geriatric. Um, did you notice that their mental health was improving during the socialization part of the project? You could really see every time we walked in and their faces lit up. Uh, they Every time I came in for my internship, they would say, when are your friends coming back to volunteer with us again? We can't wait for them to come back. It also, um, we could even see an, improve, an improvement in their physical health as well. The day after my very first community service trip, I went in for my internship, and my mentor actually told me that they had said it was the best sleep of their lives afterwards. So I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> Mr. Harris. Yeah, what, what would you say was the, the best social? Um, uh, their favorite, my personal favorite as well, are the dances because they love when you like grab their hands and dance with them. They love that part. Uh, the students loved to get them dancing and talk to them. You would see them squatting down next to them and having conversations throughout these dances. They, we all loved that part. Amelia. Yeah, so uh, that focuses on promoting meaningful relationships through not only nursing home residents, but also through uh, children, like I did here, as well as animals. They do a lot of animal therapy and nature. They focus a lot on greenery. 
It also does a little bit of work on promoting mental health for staff who work in these facilities because since we have such a high staff turnover rate in these facilities, especially right now during the COVID issues, it makes it really hard for the staff to form connections with the residents. And so the Eden alternative actually was linked to a 26% decrease in staff turnover rates, which really helped them form these meaningful relationships. I think that they really enjoyed being able to communicate with the older generation because not everybody has like grandparents who they interact with, so not everyone has worked much with the older generation. They also, in the survey that I mentioned that I set out, sent out, they improved their communication skills, not only communicating with the residents, but also among each other. Um, and some of them are even working with Rochelle right now to volunteer on their own beyond. Watkins. So kind of to check off of what we just said, it looks like y'all had a, a really good time. How do you convince more of people your age to go and, and do this even in their own time? I mean, it looks like you had a blast. So how do you convince them to do it more? Um, I really think it's important for them to know that it has such a beneficial impact for themselves, and I think that they should know that it benefits the residents as well, and it helps you. It helps both of you just feel really good to know that you can give back to your community like that. I think that that's important. Yes. Um, for me, it wasn't too bad just because my mom is a nurse, so I volunteered in the nursing home before pre-COVID. I was also getting my CNA license during this at this facility, actually, so I knew a lot of them from that as well. So that definitely helped me form the relationships that I had with them. Is this, uh, do you think the elderly is where you want to be focused in your, your health career going forward? No, um, I want to go into neurosurgery, actually. Okay. <laughs> but uh, it was just a great opportunity that we had here nearby. Lucy. You mean how I, like their, like their abilities? So that's why we had, on my very first trip, I mentioned the board games that we had. We had that for residents who couldn't or didn't want to get as physically active. You can see at the dance, a lot of them are in their wheelchairs here. So they didn't have to like get up and dance. We would just go around and try to include everybody as much as possible. We would like grab their hands and get them to dance with us and things like that. So we definitely had alternative solutions for people who couldn't be as physically active. But overall, I didn't really see too much of an issue with it. Sam, tell me if I'm not loud enough. Tell me if I'm not loud enough.
Throughout my life, I've been exposed to STEM in many different manners, whether it was the Lego sets my parents bought for me as a kid or as a book that taught me how to code. No matter what, I believe that this early exposure has had a positive experience on my life and in my educational career. Hi, I'm Cole Owen, and my project is the importance of STEM education in adolescence. I chose the quote, millions saw the apple fall, but Newton asked why, by Bernard Baruch as my quote of quality, because I believe it truly embodies the thought process behind STEM and all the great minds within the field. As something as simple as an in as a inquiry about an apple falling from a tree can lead to world-changing discoveries. My mentors for the project were Donna Swingler, the head counselor at PVCC's Kids College, where I served my internship, and Allie Hodell, the tag teacher at Moss Knuckles Elementary School, where I served my community service. For my internship, as I said, I worked at PVCC's Kids College, a STEM enrichment program that runs over the summer. I interned there over the month of June, and during my time, I was able to work with the teachers as they set up the classroom for the students, and I was also able to work hands-on with the students and help them through any problems they were experienced with, with the many different STEM programs. So during my internship, I went in with the main goal of just seeing how a STEM classroom was structured and also how just a brief moment of exposure can impact these students as I was only interning there for a month. And during my time, I was able to see a drastic impact between uh, their problem solving skills and their critical thinking as early on, they would be asking simple questions that I know they could have been thinking through themselves, but by the end, whenever they came across a problem that they didn't truly really understand, they first took a moment to just think about it rather than immediately raising their hand for help. Another thing that I pulled away from my internship was, like I said, how to set up a STEM classroom as that takes a very different approach compared to a normal classroom as it's very hands-on and interactive. I also learned how to work with uh, young children, which proved to be useful during my uh, community service as I was working with fifth graders. As I said, for my community service, I worked at my former elementary school, Moss Knuckles, with my tag teacher, Allie Hodell. I worked with just her fifth grade tag class through an eight-week-long eight coding course using the Code.org's free program. This program ran from early September to late October, and it showed them the basics of how to code that could be applied to any, to any language in general, not just a specific language like Java or Python. During my community service, I saw very similar results as what I did during my internship, as many of the students quickly took an interest in the field itself, as uh, at the end I t took a survey and seven out of the eight students said that they wanted to further pursue STEM in the future. I also saw a similar impact in their problem solving skills and critical thinking as they showed the same trend as the internship students did where they would ask simple questions but then by the end they were ready to tackle any challenge I gave them almost. For my research, I focused on the importance of STEM education in adolescence with the main question of what impact does STEM education have on young children? During my research, I found many statistics that backed up any prior understandings I had of the field in that it's the fastest growing in the field, but not only is it that, but it's projected to see an around 11% job growth between 2021 and 2031. But this is also going to be faced with the setback that there is, it is projected that 2 million jobs will go unfilled within the general field of STEM by 2025. In addition to this, there are mass underrepresentation uh, by women, Hispanics, and African Americans, as these groups make up a very small minority within the field. And women, for example, even though they do make up a majority within the healthcare sector of STEM, Overall, they are still heavily underrepresented. In African Americans and Latinos, for example, they only make up approximately 10% of the STEM-based PhDs altogether. In addition to this gender and ethnicity-based underrepresentation, there is also underrepresentation in rural schools like Louisa. 
in rural communities, they do not have the same funding or outreach that many of the suburban schools do as they are able to have more advanced programs. But this has been counteracted by outreach programs such as Project Lead the Way and 100K and 10, as, these, as one of these programs, 100K and 10, trains teachers for rural schools and urban schools to have access to quality STEM teachers to make sure students are truly understanding what they are learning. And also Project Lead the Way provides kits for schools to, to perform these STEM lessons as, many, as that is another major aspect of why they cannot get the same experience as urban schools. And then a major part of my research was just the impact of it and how it impacts, impacts their educational career. And many students within these uh, experimental STEM classes saw about a 40% increase in passing rate in advanced science classes, a similar percentage in advanced math classes, and about a 50% increase in passing college classes. Throughout my project, one thing that really stuck out to me is that disabilities do not have to hold you back. And I did not go into my project thinking I would gain this, but a student, James, from my, from my internship really showed me this. As James had a hearing disability, which made it often difficult for him to understand what the teacher was talking about or what the lesson was, as he often couldn't hear him over the background noise of the entire class. But whenever this happened, he would always make sure that he raised his hand to make sure that he could get that further explanation that he needed to keep up with the class or even finish before, him, before the rest at times. Another personal impact uh, within this project is just how much, uh, how much impact on interest this early exposure to STEM education can have. As I previously stated, seven out of the eight students I taught in this fifth grade tag class were able, uh, saw a dramatic increase in their interest within the field. And also, I did share my plans with the remaining elementary schools in the school system, in Louise County school system in order to, for more students to get this early exposure to STEM education. For my future plans, I will attend the University of Virginia, where I will study finance and data science, and I will continue to use the lessons I've learned throughout my senior project of how to act in an interview or how to present like I'm doing today. No matter what, I will continue to use these lessons in my everyday professional endeavors. I would like to say thank you to Ms. King, my mentors, Ms. Swingler and Ms. Hodel, and also my parents for all the assistance you have given me throughout this year. Are there any questions? Katie. Uh, not really. I mean, for James specifically, I, I maybe had to get a little closer to him when I was explaining something he was having problems with. But he acted just like how the other children were and interacted with them the same way they would interact with each other. Ms. Wodo. How would you recommend to this grade achieve? I mean, that's a tremendous opportunity for them. How would you recommend that those kids keep those skills? Because they're going to go into sixth grade mm -hmm. where they not available to them. Well, so the great thing about code.org is they can continue to have access to the website and continue working through maybe some of the programs we didn't get to th during my lesson just because we didn't have enough time over those eight weeks because I was only meeting with them once a week. Mm -hmm. But they're able to still go into code.org or even expand into other programs and just continue learning about coding and STEM altogether. Mr. Ayers. Yeah. Honestly, I went into it with the expectation is like, oh, I don't know how this is going to work out just because I didn't truly have experience with younger children besides my internship. But going in, it was a very, they were a very well organized group. They were very open to suggestion and any comments I had were like, oh, maybe try doing this. They didn't have any like breakdowns about, oh, no, my answer's right or anything like that. So there was a, a, you know, a 40% increase in, in people with the use of STEM. Are the lessons for STEM applicable for lower-end students? 
Uh, yes, they are. And that is another uh, goal I have with the expansiveness of my project. Not only do I want it to go to the other elementary schools, but I want it to, be, to enter just the general curriculum for all students to get this early exposure. Yes. Uh, no, I didn't. I was purely focused with the uh, tag class, just because I had a connection there with my former tag teacher that I could, if I had any questions, she was always available to help out as she, and also she had worked with the governor's school curriculum before, so she understood what the project entailed. Two million. Uh, yes. Yes, they are all degree, which is another reason that these minority groups are seeing less access to the field is the financial means to get this degree is very difficult for some, some of these groups and often acts as a very large barrier. I don't know if I have... I guess the big aha moment was that I actually was able to see the students enjoying my lessons and uh, whatever I threw at them, they were always willing to take on a challenge. And so I almost saw myself in those kids. It was like, oh, I always loved like, because when I was in elementary school, we'd maybe have one day every, every semester or something that we would just sit down and code on this same code.org platform. all of you for attending today and that concludes our first day of presentations. Um, we will rejoin at 8.30 tomorrow morning for day number two. Right. Nice job. You okay? Yeah.